Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so we move now to Professor um, Chair Danidis. And um, he, well, we, everybody knows who he is, but he is Director of the Institute of International Economic Relations in Athens, where we're all sitting right now. And he's going to take us from Northern Europe down here to the Mediterranean, and he's going to talk to exactly. us about the 2008 economic crisis in Cyprus, a de-Europeanization or a shelter-seeking strategy. Thank you. That's true. We are going now to the south. Uh, Okay. So, uh, this is the structure of my presentations. Uh, first of all, is an introduction. Uh, then I shall analyze very briefly uh, Cyprus foreign policy as a small state. Then. I'll say some things about the economic crisis of 2013 in Cyprus and I shall try then to evaluate the impact of economic crisis on the process of Europeanization or de-Europeanization linking it with the seeking shelter strategy and uh, finally I have the conclusions so small states in, in the European Union to what extent they benefit from the membership? First of all, we have a discussion yesterday and more or less we have uh, concluded that membership in the European Union, especially for small states, is a shelter and could benefit the economy and even their foreign policy. However, as we we'll see from the Cyprus cases, case, this is not always the case because uh, EU could enforce or it is a reason uh, which deteriorates sometimes uh, the economy or the small states try to find another shelter outside of the European Union. This was the case in Greece for six months and then I shall try to point out this is the case of uh, Cyprus for a while. How the economic crisis has impact upon the Europeanization, the Europeanization of Cyprus foreign policy. In other words, if the economic crisis uh, uh, promoted the Europeanization process or the de Europeanization process. And the shelter seeking strategy, as uh, Thorason has just uh, pointed out, revolves around the idea that small states, due to their vulnerability in the international system, are compelled to seek shelter. To what extent shelter policy for EU members is the other side of Europeanization? Is it or not? What Cyprus seeking shelter was Cyprus seeking shelter policy successful or not? So, let's say two or three things about Cyprus foreign policy. Of course, I'm not going to analyze the strategic value between Europe and South Mediterranean Mid East uh, Cyprus. This is, I think, very obvious even from the Cold War times. Even more after the Cold War, what is happening in, in the Middle East. Cyprus pursued neutrality during the Cold War and a non-alignment policy as a center seeking strategy. And I'm arguing here, I said some things uh, yesterday, that it was quite successful. It was quite successful because uh, uh, Cyprus was able to remain uh, sovereign, what we mean sovereign under the London uh, uh, Lausanne uh, treaties is questionable, however, as Finland is questionable is, is, if it was fully sovereign state because of its obligations in the foreign policy field towards the Soviet Union. We could discuss it, <laughs> of course. And Greece, the motherland, was a shelter or not? 
it proved uh, during uh, the crisis of Cyprus, which started in 1950, in the 1950s, that sometimes Greece was trying to uh, towards the unification. And the most obvious example, of course, was the coup d'etat of the Greek colonels in 1974, where Cyprus lost its sovereignty because there was a Huda which uh, uh, established with uh, the uh, Greece uh, dictatorship regime. Another, of course, important factor for Cyprus foreign policy all these years up to now uh, is uh, that the full membership of EU since 2004 <laughs> was made mainly for security reasons. The Cyprus economy, there, was, there is no need. It has an association agreement. It had access to the main British market. The main reason behind the application of Cyprus to acquire membership was security. Because by this way, it was uh, sure that uh, will be uh, not possible for Turkey to do something else uh, and to solve the Cyprus problem because since 1974 the island was divided into parts, the occupied part by Turkey which declared its independence uh, in 1983 and uh, on the other hand it was uh, the, uh, Yes, it, it declared its independence in, in 1983. Uh, and the other was under the threat of Turkey and still is. So the Cyprus problem and the relation with Turkey was the most important thing for Cyprus foreign policy. We try with many means uh, to, uh, to, to find a, a, a way of uh, securing itself. Uh, first through the United Nations, in this work, then membership with the European Union, and then uh, because Cyprus has prioritized a regional security and cooperation, also is a key element of its foreign policy. It showed recently, during the last uh, uh, 15 years, uh, to have a close relationship with regional actors uh, like Egypt and Israel in order to address these challenges. So, let me say some things about uh, the 2013 economic crisis. Because at that time, uh, after three years, almost the Greek uh, economic crisis, Cyprus entered in a serious economic crisis. First of all, there was lack of economic diversification in its economy. For decades, the Cypriot economy had been heavily reliant on the banking and real estate state sectors. And when Cyprus star a borrowing cost rose steadily because of its exposure to Greek debts, two or three uh, Cypriot uh, banks uh, uh, were exposed to the, they have uh, bought uh, Greek bonds and especially of banks bond was, uh, uh, was in danger. So there was a danger of the collapse bank, actually collapsed, and so for the first time in the European economic crisis, uh, later on after the management of the crisis, they decided to have bail-in and bail-out at the same time. Bail-in for two uh, banks. Uh, the Cyprus uh, Bank and uh, the Popular Bank, and especially the Popular Bank uh, was closed and everybody uh, lost uh, uh, their money. On the same time, the property market eventually crashed in 2008 as a result of the global financial crisis. But over above, there were bad political decisions. The government which has been elected was pro-communist. It was based on Akel Communist Party and the president was the former general secretary of the Communist Party of Akel. So the government should have negotiated assistance uh, from the European Union or from the IMF in the summer of 2011 
or even after one year in the summer of 2012, but instead when the situation was uh, increasing uh, and the crisis was obvious for the Cypriot banks, asked for a negotiation in March 2013. And uh, so Cyprus experienced numerous downgrades of its credit ratings in 2012 and has since been cut off from international man money market. So there was no other uh, uh, way. But Cyprus, as I argue, they tried to move towards the Europeanization process and ask from Russia to have loans. Successfully, uh, they took a loan from Moscow, but later when they asked a second one, Moscow refused uh, to <coughs> proceed. I explain why. So, talking about Europeanization, of course, everybody is familiar with the term uploading and the loan. Uh, the, uh, and the Cyprus successfully is a member uh, of uh, uploading Europeanization. In other words, was managed to bring in the agenda, especially in the foreign policy field, its security system, with uh, its security problem, with uh, the assistance of the Greek government. Uh, and this is why, uh, as uh, 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 the uh, former minister uh, Kurkulas pointed out, due to Greece's diplomatic uh, maneuvers, Cyprus managed to uh, become a full member of the European Union. But also the Cyprus government was able to upload its national issue at the European uh, 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 Council meetings and uh, uh, even to the European Commission. So the second point is that closer ties with Russia uh, was as a center by seeking bilateral loans. Uh, I told you that uh, in the beginning of the crisis managed to take a substantial loan from Moscow and then during uh, the crisis Cyprus explored the possibility of securing financial support from Russia as an alternative or supplementary source of funding to the Troika bailout package to balance it. It didn't succeed. Moscow was not very keen to provide additional loans. Why? For the same reason why the Greek government, uh, the new Syriza government, in the first months of 2015, uh, tried to have uh, loans from Russia and in fell because there was a close political and economic relationship of Moscow with Berlin. Do you remember it was uh, the, the pipelines, uh, North uh, Stream pipeline, and Moscow did not uh, want it, was not willing to involve uh, in the, let's say, domestic problems of the European Union. So, after that, uh, the, uh, there was a change in Cyprus government and there was a successful re-Europeanization of its policy. EU for remained in the eyes of decision-making elites the most reliable partner. And then we could see, paradoxically, uh, like in Greece, that the austerity programs of the EU being implemented successfully. Paradoxically, I say that it was the left government which implemented uh, with a third memorandum uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the implementation of the austerity problem. So, let's go to my conclusions, if I have five minutes. First of all, relying on the Europeanization and de Europeanization concept, I'll try to link it with the sector seeking strategy. Europeanization is a, a sector seeking strategy, rather, to, uh, to put it in another word, the sector seeking strategy could be used in two ways. It could 
lead towards urbanization and it could lead towards de-urbanization. So I tried to analyze the impact of the Eurozone crisis on the foreign policy of Cyprus. The crisis highlights the vulnerability of small states in the global financial system. Okay. And the bail-in model, especially for the two Cypriot banks, and the bailout condition imposed by the EU and IF, caused a great deal of Euroscepticism and delusion in the Cyprus public opinion. So, there was a de-Europeanization process in the case of Cyprus during the economic crisis period of 2008-2018, but mainly during the 2013 uh, crisis, and is a product of the derationalization process in the field of foreign policy, uh, 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 which means a renationalization, actually, that uh, the, uh, some of the decision makers uh, decide to renationalize the national uh, the foreign policy and of not following the Europeanization process, uh, which uh, was uh, noticed before. S uh, sorry, Cyprus' reaction to the economic crisis was not successful undoubtedly. In the initial phase, President Christophias, who was supported by the Communist Party Akel, tried to ensure an alternative seeking strategy, in particular towards Russia, which failed. And the Cypriot Europhile leadership has sought further and has a re -Europeanization. So. After 2013 crisis, Cyprus uh, uh, reopenized its uh, foreign policy. And another general conclusion which derives from the Cyprus case, I think, is that certain seeking strategy is not clearly distinct from bad vanguardism. I think Weevil has pointed out that that usually uh, the uh, the small states uh, are following bad vanguardism. So, weak economies for me of small member states like Cyprus or Greece and even Portugal are obliged to follow a policy in the crisis framework of TINA. You know, TINA, there is no alternative. We have to follow the European, let's say, uh, uh, not recommendation, but what I call it is enforced Europeanization. You have no other alternative. You have to obey. We have to press you until you respect uh, the uh, memorandum condition, which actually you have signed, after all, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm saving a couple of minutes until, until the end, so we go our next speaker, Ms. Effie Sherelapaki. Thank you. Um, wow. And our, well, this paper is also with Mr. Kostas Hechinakis. Okay, I'm working on my Greek. Ms. Nefele <laughs> Athanasaki, Mr. Ah. Georgos Frakos, and Mr. Valasid Simitsis. Uh, this is the research program on the theory and practice of international relations here again, our wonderful hosts in Athens. And they're going to talk about small states as agents of change and innovation in the European space. The cases of Ireland, Greece, Cyprus, and Iceland. Thank you very much, uh, Hilary. And thank you very much again, everybody, for being here. Uh, we're very honored and thank you for attending this uh, uh, morning panel. Uh, so before I start, I need to make a disclaimer that uh, me and my colleagues, we are not small state uh, scholars and uh, we are not small state researchers. Uh, I'm focusing on IR theory, uh, mainly meta theory, order-disorder uh, order processes and security. Uh, my colleague is, follow, uh, is uh, focusing on uh, international political economy and uh, fairly on uh, European studies. So we have joined forces and we're using small state uh, a la carte uh, in order to draw some empirical uh, conclusions that will inform a theory, a, a framework we are trying to develop that could become a theoretical framework. 
Um, so, excuse me, I just need to find uh, the comments here because in order to be able to read them, uh, and, and I apologize for the... Um, uh, Mr. Polaris, αν μπορείτε να, να μας δείξετε πού πρέπει να πατήσω. I, I'm sorry for the interruption. Thank you. Ε, πώς μπορώ αυτό να το κάνω, comments, για να, για να τα διαβάζω. Αυτό, να γίνει, ε, να γίνει comments. Απλά να το, να το πάω έτσι. Δεν φαίνεται όμως, τώρα δεν φαίνεται καθόλου σωστά. Κανονικά φαίνεται αυτό. Όμω εσεί θέλετε να διαβάζετε και τα comments εδώ τα οποία είναι Εντάξει, πάρα okay. πολλά. Ναι, είναι μόνο αυτό. Αν θέλετε να διαβάσετε, να το διαβάσω όσο μπορώ. Μπορείτε να το. Ωραία, εντάξει. I apologize to everybody. It's just a crucial. Um, so. Uh, what we are trying to do here, uh, it's uh, before uh, Professor Thorhalson, who is, uh, we regard him, and it's a great honor you are here with us, we regard him one of the fathers of uh, shelter theory, so we have so much to learn. Um, uh, 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 mentioned about the critical junctures, uh, which are very important to be explored methodologically in order not only uh, to advance shelter theory, but to draw from shelter theory in order uh, to jump into other frameworks and possible theoretical conclusions. And that small states should always do a cost-benefit analysis. They are seeking economic, societal and political uh, shelter. And they are very uh, vulnerable. They have structural vulnerabilities. So it's uh, their priority in order to boost resilience should be to prevent crisis, manage them and manage them even uh, in accordance with the international institutions they're seeking uh, shelter from, uh, because this crisis can become deeper and they can become actually uh, a great uh, grand uh, structural uh, crisis for international institutions. And we saw that with the 2008 uh, Europea, uh, Eurozone crisis. So in, in the era of a perma crisis, which is characterized by structural poly crisis, we have one crisis after the other and they're all uh, interconnected and simultaneous, uh, there is the occurrence of le several multi-level, multi-sectoral interconnected crises on all fronts. So international institutions uh, need to manage small shocks that could lead to their disintegration. Uh, so they should uh, start to do a cost-benefit analysis of the fragility the, ex the experience should become more sustainable. And when you have a whole, you cannot actually address the fragility and the complexity of the whole without ad addressing the fragility and the complexity of the parts that constitute this whole. And the whole is never um, just its parts, is more uh, than the number of its parts. So, uh, what we are trying to do here is, are there lessons learned from the 2008-09 Eurozone crisis according to the particularities of those four states, Ireland, Cyprus, Greece and Iceland, that could advise their foreign policy and economic diplomacy in the present volatile environment? Could microstates become innovation hubs for the European space that could inform the EU strategic compass via their economic governance? And how could microstates enhance the EU's institutional resilience via the, their agency as global say, states? And we saw this uh, characteristic example is Ireland, that is a small state, a state that has managed to become a global uh, state in the global uh, order, a small global state. So, small states have foreign policy options and for a comprehensive policy to be built, we need to examine small states' possibilities of influencing EU foreign policy via their distribution of capabilities, alliances, economic diplomacy, uh, societal cultural connections, security concerns, political elites, coalition buildings and other factors. Small states' foreign policy strategies for survival in an anarchic environment uh, international system, 
as standalone entities that are not unitary actors. This is uh, uh, what uh, uh, Kenneth Waltz is saying to us, but this is something that methodologically cannot coincide with shelter theory that does not treat all small states are the same uh, unitary actors. So, uh, therefore, smallness is a variable that matters. And there is no one size fits all. Size matters. As Professor Thorhalson in his books and uh, his manuscripts has uh, mentioned, so has uh, taught us so many times. So, small states' role must be examined across various areas of the EQ foreign policy in order to create a comprehensive theoretical and policy framework. In other words, how small states' political processes domestically, regionally and internationally vary across different policy areas and how this affects structures and regimes they interact with or are members of. And the EU is a characteristic example. So here we have a, a, a is something that should be addressed. We have structure versus size. We have the structure of the EU, but, and also we have the size, but we, because we see that all small states cannot be treated as uh, unitary actors. They have uh, uh, differences, size matters, and so forth. So given some reasonable assumptions, certain correlations among contributes, uh, attributes excuse me, of small states are inevitable, especially when their structures uh, are affected by attributes of the same organization, such as the Eurozone. So, two arguments here. We have a methodological and substantive. And before I go on, I need to say something that I didn't say at the beginning, I had it in the comments, that what we are trying to do here is uh, because uh, we need to analyze to address the critical junctures. Uh, in our research, we take three critical junctures. We have, we starting from the 2008-9 Eurozone crisis, where, where all these uh, four small states experienced it uh, uh, deeply. Some of them managed to get out of it. Greece is still uh, struggling. We have the 2020-22, the pandemic crisis, where we saw that the Eurozone crisis drew its lessons, uh, excuse me, the Eurozone and the international institutions draw their lessons from the Eurozone crisis in 2008. And this way, we did not have complete collapse. So in the meantime, it means that they managed to build the resilience. And then we have the present time, where it's uh, the era of uh, poly crisis, uh, where we see we have stagflation, we have the war in Ukraine that has bought energy and food insecurity, uh, we have the climate crisis and environmental uh, uh, degradation. We see what's happening in Greece uh, these days, that how cl climate crisis has affected the whole economy of Greece. Uh, so we are taking these three junctures and uh, we are trying to address how, uh, by creating probably a policy framework, uh, uh, there could be a resilience for small states that also could be, uh, there could be a blueprint uh, that could be uh, directed from the European structures towards small states. Uh, in order to create more resilience and in the small states and um, uh, in, uh, in the European structure as a whole and openness, of course. So there are causal relationships here. In order to assess if those four states are agents of change and innovation in the European structure, in order to boost resilience and mitigate vulnerabilities for them and the EU structures, we have decided to assess the good and bad equilibria of these four states, uh, as I told you in those uh, crises that I mentioned before. So causality, we think, is unidirectional and bidirectional, uh, from the size to the structure, but also uh, both ways and the other way. So other parameters matter. Uh, the capacity of the size to weather vulnerabilities and boost resilience. And also I should mention, and, I, and I'm saying that very, very humbly, uh, I, should, I had I've changed uh, the, the research design three times in order to be able for us to do this research uh, because I, I encounter many methodological problems. So any critiques you have, any comments, any suggestions would be very valuable in order to see how to move uh, forward uh, with what we are trying to do here. Excuse me. So we are treating, uh, we have these four states, uh, we're treating uh, size as subject variable. 
And we're trying to see how there is a capacity to adapt both good and bad equilibria and rate the rate of growth. And our independent variables become crisis response by cha changes in degrees of complexity, horizontal or vertical cooperation processes, hierarchical and non-hierarchical interconnections across different levels and locations, governance outcomes, conceptualized foreign policy in terms of governance outcomes, measured by degrees of self-organization, deliberation, commitment, and immaterial resources such as knowledge sharing and expertise sharing. And uh, we have a synthesis method design that we are trying to develop here, and that's why I didn't share our paper yet, because it's in an, a, an evolutionary state. Uh, developing a preliminary synthesis, exploring the relationship between studies, assessing the, valid the validity of the synthesis, and then uh, it, it, we're trying to do the theory formulation. Now, the theory is the theory that I am personally trying to develop, the innovation cooperation framework uh, for regions and international institutions. So we are drawing from uh, uh, Skander and Nasra's uh, paper, and uh, we are examining uh, the factors, commitment, EU, how these four states have reacted according to the factors and during this three uh, uh, structural cr uh, crises, uh, both for their structure and the structure of the European Union. Commitment, EU foreign policy, network capital, resources and deliberation. And the dimensions are according to these uh, factors. For example, commitment, we have relative silence. We see that, for example, in the Eurozone crisis of 2008, thank you, um, uh, 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 for example, uh, Ireland, there was uh, silence, the minor silence, uh, something that wasn't uh, in Greece. So I I'm not going to analyze that because we do not have a, a lot of time. I'm sorry, just to move forward. And then uh, we see we, we will see for the four states the level of influence. Uh, like, for example, high, if, if there was a uh, high, uh, we saw that especially with Troika and Ireland, uh, EU policies reflect the members' preferences uh, despite opposition or disinterest of other members, medium, progress or agreement that reflect the members' preferences in some areas and does not go against uh, its interest in others. Uh, low, some issues are in line with the member states' interest, but some go against them. And if there is no level of influence, uh, EU policies goes against a member's preferences. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're trying to get from Salter theory to innovation cooperation. So not only small states literature, but also governance and organizational designs that are essential for comprehensive EU area policy need a methodological design that examines the relationship between organizational structural forms, system transformation, and innovativeness. Innovation as a process of knowledge creation and sharing and organizational learning that enhance the adaptation at the micro and macro levels. Capacity for, for transformation, change and adaptation and capacity for network governance and joint cooperation governance, which is uh, uh, the lessons learned we're mentioning in the aspect, in, in our abstract, to see uh, how each uh, state can learn from the other uh, state and how this can be translated into uh, policy and governance. For example, Greece has so much to learn uh, from Ireland and Iceland as well. So the aim is to present the correlation and differences between those four states in terms of how their openness impacts uh, according four constructs, strategy, triggers they had, outcomes, and level of openness. And we think that in order for small states to build resilience, of course, openness is, uh, for us is the most important thing in this study. So we're trying to examine how openness provides opportunities to reduce the development cost and development time for these four states during these critical junctures, and how open innovation positively impacts on the process innovation, which requires investment by international organizations and communities within states. So this is what we are um, uh, uh, we are uh, trying to develop here. We think that this is missing from the EU as a whole. There should be a policy about that, or at least that could guide governance. 
so open innovation, uh, according to Chesbo, uh, if, uh, Chesbro, uh, pro, uh, it, it, open innovation is proposed as a distributed innovation process based on purposefully managed knowledge flows across organizational boundaries using um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I cannot see it with these glasses. Uh, Pessitary and not pensitary mechanisms in line with the organization's model. So uh, I'm going, if we have, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, uh, concluding that there should be actually a model of meta governance. I can, I can go into because we do not have time uh, later. Uh, and, and I apologize, uh, Kostas, no, is no, there anything okay. that no, you no, no, would okay, like okay. to add empirically? Maybe. Yeah, basically only I would like to to add some uh, basic information about the four countries, but now I think uh, maybe in we the are questions okay. and you yeah, can yeah, address that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, this is our presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, criticism, comments, because it's a research design in progress. We have it has many um, gaps right now, uh, so we would appreciate any uh, feedback. Thank you very much. Should I stay here? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much to all our presenters. Um, I think that was two very interesting papers founded together by Shelter. Um, I think from from my perspective listening, I think Valder, you've, uh, on from a theoretical perspective, you're offering us some advancement of shelter theory in the sense of understanding how historical processes impact on decisions to seek shelter. Do you contribute also how uh, economic and societal and different types of shelter might then uh, spill over or affect um, other areas of shelter, in this case moving towards closer security shelter? You showed us how the decisions of larger states, the US or Russia in this case, affect the decisions of states to seek shelter. So it's not just their own decision, but the actions of others. And um, I think you are bringing in this idea of crisis junctures. So I think there's four very interesting theoretical aspects in there. Uh, and then empirically, well, it's very timely to look at Sweden and Finland, and I'll be Curious to know if people in the room align with your argument that this was a natural progression and not a not a departure. So, um, so it was very interesting. And um, Professor Jordanidis, you theoretically, I think you provide interesting insights on uh, whether it's when when the organization is not providing sufficient shelter, it might push the small state towards other shelter providers. And I think that's something we should be wary of. But I think you also show that leadership matters because under mm -hmm. one leader, Cyprus decided to seek an alternative provider, but then when the government changed, it went back. But it's not only the leader of the small state. If Moscow had said yes to providing those bilateral loans, perhaps you'd be looking at this case as more successful than not successful. So I think you really bring out the importance of leadership in, in that regard. And your case is also very interesting in terms of showing us more specifically how Cyprus navigated the crisis. I do have a question that I wanted to ask you. You said that neutrality and non-alignment were a shelter-seeking strategy. Um, and I wonder if you could expand on that because so let me give Malta as an example when it was it's neutral constitution in a military sense but it seeks shelter by being aligned with the European Union when it was non-aligned it would seek shelter by hedging between different providers in your case I just wonder in what way do you understand that Cyprus being neutral and non-aligned was a shelter-seeking strategy. That was a little unclear. And then on um, on the the last paper, um, it was it was also. Oh, and I think I will ask the question that you posed to Professor Torhas, and he you were asked by um, by the professor whether uh, sh what is the difference between shelter and bandwagoning. So I'll leave these questions with you. And the last paper. I think is 
is interesting um it's trying to especially the the comparative aspect trying to derive lessons i was a little bit unclear on the the central research question because first mm -hmm. i thought you were trying to understand the european union as a, a structure how small states can uh, seek assistance to recover during times of crisis but then you were talking about them as agents of change and innovation which is a slightly different question and then you were also talking about the effect of openness on policy so i was it sounds like there are quite a few different questions in here so i i wonder if you could distill the sort of the the main research question and then the subsidiary ones so, just, so that will i think help us to to come in so i saw all the hands fly straight up so we'll we'll come around the room so mm -hmm. one two three four and then i'll come back to the room good morning to all i enjoyed all papers uh, i have uh, a question for each uh, for uh, professional solutions uh if you could uh, please uh, share a comment um and expand uh, on um that's so much sadness uh expand on your uh argument with the help of a counterfactual what if the what now predicament that we mentioned in the end what if the Russian invasion hadn't taken place? What if, in a much more catastrophic scenario, Trump had won the US <laughs> presidential elections? Uh, my question to Professor Tsardanidis, and uh, I will probably uh, raise my attention to one of his favorite subjects, uh, Europeanization. I was intrigued uh, by your comments in the end with uh, the Pina remark. Uh, you virtually um, uh, equated uh, the uh, rationality, rationalization with Europeanization. And I understand that uh, when the, um, the issue is framed as a comply or Paris, uh, in comply or Paris terms, then you should comply in this rational. Uh, but uh, this begs the question, is it rational to pose such a predicament? Uh, uh, to equate uh, the, 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 to, to pose uh, uh, the comply or Paris uh, condition as a rational one and forget about get keeping process for us. And my question for the third paper probably it would give you the chance to expand on the thing that uh, mm -hmm. you were not able due to time restrictions to expand in the end about the empirics. Uh, do you? Uh, it was unclear um, whether uh, you have a, a purpose of uh, ranking or grading the four countries into uh, discussion uh, in relation to their innovation uh, uh, capacity or success uh, uh, or uh, with the criterion of innovation cooperation per se. So thank you very much. Okay, so yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I know I I must leave at twelve, but uh, but I make the questions, and if you have time to answer, good. If not, you have the questions. Um, to the first speaker, I have a simple question: What was, in your view, uh, uh, behind the term Finlandization at the time of the Cold War, and the fear of fin Finlandization in the West? Uh, you seem to say that uh, it was nothing. I mean, it was just rhetoric, but there was nothing behind Finlandization. That must, that's my f first question. The second question is to you. Uh, first of all, uh, a comment. I never understood, or then, back uh, in the 1990s, why Cyprus wanted to enter the EU for security reasons, because the EU was not a security organization, it was NATO. And therefore, already then, I asked uh, the, the Cyprus audiences of uh, a SEPS meeting, uh, wh what are you thinking about? And uh, the, the answer was not clear. Uh, 
there was a, a reasoning that the, the EU was a kind of shelter and nobody would dare to attack uh, Cyprus because it was a member of the EU. That was the kind of of, of, of reasoning, uh, and in that uh, in that uh, spirit, I am asking you, uh, what do you think? What, what do you think Cyprus expect from Israel to do in a case of a security threat? Because that might lead to, to a big confusion. I mean, I am about sure. Uh, we, I have not asked anybody that. Um, Israel is not ready to defend uh, Cyprus in case that Turkey, for example, does something with, uh, with the South. Therefore, it would be interesting to know what the calculations are of uh, the Cypriot people concerning these regional security structures. And the same goes for Egypt. That's my question. The other, is the third, is a suggestion to Effie but I don't know how it fits in what she is trying to develop. And this is what I call the necessity for a small state to be able to improvise. So the, 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 the question of improvisation becomes central for a small state. A small state must be ready to improvise because contrary to what uh, uh, it was uh, said here, um, it cannot always uh, prevent a crisis from developing. Crises come all along, all along. And uh, so they must be prepared, their people must be prepared to devise quickly a strategy when the crisis arises, improvising. Uh, and for this, you need daring, you must need people accustomed to take risks, etc., etc. I am I don't belong to this class, so I I would, but I see what happens in Israel. Oh, uh, there are incredible people there because they are trained already in their heads to improvise. So there comes a crisis, and now we must devise something to survive. Okay, so uh, I don't know how you want to fit that into your model, but it's important. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have question to uh, question and remark to uh, Professor Tor uh, Torhalson. Uh, you said about the Russian-Ukrainian invasion and change Finland thinking. Uh, did you mean the invasion uh, in 2014 after Crimea, Crimea crisis or the full-scale uh, invasion? And one remark about NATO in the 90s, they were countries in Europe like Poland, Czech and uh, Hungary who perceived uh, Russia as a threat and wanted, wanted to be a, a NATO members, like we joined in 1999. Uh, and uh, question to uh, uh, Effie, it's like to be precise in definition, how do you understand the Organization, uh, organizational structure? Is it only the EU institutions name in Lisbon Treaty or you perceive it's uh, in a like bigger, uh, uh, wider way, uh, adding all uh, EU agencies uh, and Euro European External Action Service as well? Only institution or wider? Okay. So we'll take uh, Professor Barry's question, then we'll have a response from the panelists. We'll do one more round of questions, final comments, and we'll So let's. Uh... Okay, so a quick question for Effie. It seems to me your collection of states is rather random, the ones that you look at in that, yeah, Iceland is clearly not in the EU and the others are, you know, and there, there are other small states that you could include, that, um, such as Portugal and Latvia, for example, that would be very interesting to look at. So I'm, I'm wondering what kind of filter did you use to choose the collection of states that you're looking at? And quest a question for Baldur. I must say, to look at your maps, I'd say everybody kind of gasped because nobody in this room has ever looked at a map of the world before with Iceland as its center. And it's like phenomenal to, to see the world from that perspective, you know, to see, you know, North America peeking in at the left-hand corner, you know, extending to, to the Scandinavian countries. Really, really interesting. So me being Irish, of course, I look at Ireland, Ireland and see all the one out there, that it's the one that's not 
has not applied for NATO membership. And you had mentioned yesterday in your question, and Professor Tobias talking about it afterwards, that Ireland is a free rider, right, in this regard. Because we know if we were invaded, I mean, Churchill, we were neutral during the Second World War because of, you know, disagreements over the Britain's control over Northern Ireland, to put it apolitically. Um, and yet, you know, Churchill had plans to invade Ireland. Now, but had the Americans invaded Ireland, that would have been fine. The Irish would not have fought. If the Britain, Brits had reinvaded Ireland, he would have had a war in their hands, you know. So Ireland definitely free rides now because we know if Russia were to invade Ireland, the Americans would come to our assistance. But why then? Do you have anything to say about Ireland? Because it would seem to me your description of Sweden free riding on its geopolitical um, geography, you know, that it knew that if Russia were to invade Sweden, the West would come to its aid. Similarly for Ireland. So do you know what? Would you have any feeling for why Ireland is able to continue to free ride on its geographic, geopolitical position? Or geographic yeah. position. Was well, it just Luca yeah. and Roderick? Yeah. 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 If it's just yeah. one of you, then I'll take that now. We'll just have uh, answers to everything. So, if you want to, yeah, you can ask. Me. Okay, so I have a question for each speaker. So, for Professor Forasson, my question is given the recent uh, NATO membership of Sweden and Finland, do you think mm -hmm. that their status as Small states will be put to question in the future, given their new geopolitical importance for NATO, the US, and secondary for the EU. Well, for Professor Chardonnay, my question is um, Is it possible to affirm that the Shuttle theory applied in, in the cyberspace uh, could be referred? as a manifestation of a political, like, intention distance uh, from the EU or from foreign, like, uh, intervention or uh, interferences, and with this I'm talking about Turkey. Sorry, I didn't get your, um, your, your question. Is it possible to repeat it? Is it possible to affirm that the shelter theory, uh, rather than... The shelter theory? Yes, yeah. shelter theory, rather than being uh, an economic uh, like uh, ontological uh, theory in the case of Cyprus, uh, it's more political. Yeah. Okay. And for, um, sorry, and my last question for uh, Ms. Chalampaki uh, is um, I'm guessing that from my perspective, your research is mainly based on uh, uh, structural institutionalism but towards the EU. And have you considered how small states uh, would use their own unit level uh, firewalls? Uh, and with it, I mean like ideology and. Yes, all right. So, um, from my understanding, your research uh, is based on a structural institutionalism point of view. And by looking at these small states that you selected, do you uh, have you considered how these states would use their domestic variables like ideology, governance, or like the, their institutional framework uh, could like collide uh, or cooperate with you on something? Okay, and the very last question is to Professor Patch. Yeah, well, one question to uh, my friend and colleague, long time friend. But I think in your works on, uh, if I am correct, which I have read, of course, the, uh, you take a much more dynamic uh, approach to shelter theory. I mean, uh, it, 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 it is not just, you can elaborate here, that it is not just a question of uh, seeking safe harbor, but also it is connected to building the right kind of uh, uh, internal uh, domestic strength, resilience, uh, as a result of, of, of these alignments, if I may call them so. And your question of um, Norway and, uh, sorry, uh, about Finland and uh, Sweden, the only comment I want to make is uh, uh, Finland and Sweden had always practiced a kind of uh, uh, active neutrality. They were not 
neutral between the fire and the firefighters. They mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. uh, built up uh, societies which were uh, Western, democratic, and uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> if the democratic institutions, which is also an aspect of security, are threatened, uh, I think that uh, this, would have, this would have been a, an important juncture for, for Norway. Uh, I keep saying Norway. <laughs> Finland and, and, and Sweden to, uh, to immediately propose it. This is uh, to, 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 to uh, membership of the alliance. So I'm not at all at all surprised, uh, given the long history of, of Finland and Sweden um, in, in the uh, European context. Uh, with respect to Cyprus, I, I am a bit uh, also a bit uh, troubled by, by what kind of security uh, Cyprus wished to get. I think Cyprus wanted from the European Union, first of all, to, uh, not to miss the train. Everybody was, was, was jumping on the weapons, including my own country, and uh, Cyprus, which had an association agreement going back to 1973, was, in my opinion, very right and willing to, to, uh, to join the European Union. That was reason number one economic. Number two, I think the, uh, the Cypriots wanted uh, not so much security. After all, the treaties of guarantee had included uh, Britain, uh, which was then a member of NATO and the European Union, and Greece, a member of the European Union, and uh, NATO, and and Turkey, which was an applicant country and uh, not in the mood that it is now under the, the present uh, government. So, uh, uh, and they had not provided the, the, the security guarantees to, to, to Cyprus. In fact, they did what they said they won't do and uh, precipitate, uh, let taxi uh, become a reality, which is, in my opinion, uh, you know, one of the huge uh, uh, important aspects of the history of, of, of Cyprus. Uh, and also the non-alignment. Non-alignment was, in, in, in my opinion, was uh, very much constrained on, on, on Makarios. It was not entirely a free choice. I mean, it was hemmed in on our side. It was uh, the constitution which was forced upon him, upon Cyprus, uh, uh, was an unworkable constitution. And then what the Greeks also, with the Greek Cypriots, rejected the famous uh, Anand plan because it replicated the state and constitution. He could not join NATO without Turkey's. Uh, the move of Turkey actually not vetoing such an application. And uh, non-alignment was the only way in which, uh, as a small state, in my opinion, Cyprus, the only uh, avenue they had to participate in the international uh, politics. And once the project of uh, the Gnosis had been torpedoed by the British for the Turks, for the long geopolitical ends, um, it was the only uh, avenue he had to be in the international political system with a group of friends. The group, of, almost a group of 77, all voters in the United Nations, or many of them neighbors of Cyprus, on whom he could rely on political support. So, my opinion, there were very certain circumstances. I mean, Macarius was trapped on our sides, and uh, <laughs> that was the only avenue forced upon the small state. Okay, that's okay. Thank you very much. You did. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's come to Professor. Okay, I shall try to be as brief as possible. First of all, uh, there is a relationship with a relationship of non-aligned status of Cyprus, if it is a certain policy or not. For me, it was a certain policy, 
uh, because especially during the Cold War, the non-aligned movement, not only the neutrality, because it's different to be neutral and it's different to be a member of the non-aligned movement, because it has the support of other states like India, for example. So it protected its name for a uh, foreign policy objective of Makarios that the island is not going to be, uh, let's say, in the NATO arts. In other words, the influence of Greece of Turkey through the NATO should uh, not lead uh, to subvert uh, the sovereignty of Cyprus. And I think he was successful. I'm not talking about the tactics then with the agency and uh, I think it, but he was successful. So for me, uh, and I have example of the crisis in 67, of the crisis of 64, uh, I was able that the United Nations uh, and mainly through the support of the Northern Ireland movement uh, to save each survey. And it's exactly the same reason why after Turkish invasion and mainly uh, when the Soviet Union was collapsed and the international system had changed and non aligned movement stopped to exist, it was a priority for security to join the EU. I don't uh, argue that the economics did play a special factor and I don't uh, uh, you know, absolutely agree with that Cyprus was ready uh, to become a full member of the group, but the main reason behind the minds of the decision makers, wrongly, uh, it was to secure uh, uh, through the membership their sovereignty and that through the European Union uh, they could feel much more secure otherwise uh, they were probably in the and especially for Israel, no, they don't expect that there will be any military assistance whatsoever from Israel or from Egypt. But building up some uh, coalitions which consist also uh, and have uh, energy, they could uh, create, politically speaking, a security environment which by this way, uh, uh, it's much more uh, efficient cycles uh, to build up its uh, security. Uh, they think that. So, you are right, I give emphasis on leadership and the perceptions of leadership. So, I'm using foreign policy analysis in order to understand. And a final point uh, for Michaelis. Yes, uh, I think I agree with you, uh, generalization. I mean uh, that it leads uh, uh, to the organization, uh, but also, uh, 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 no, uh, rationalization. But we have also the process at the same time, and we have produced a special issue, I think, uh, with Sabrina's and uh, and in fact, you know, for this case, if I'm not wrong, for mm -hmm. general European integration, especially shown big liberalization. At the same time, we will have the process of liberalization, in other words, we need their nationalization of public policy. Uh, I think I have to uh, stop here. Uh, yes. Great. Thank you. Sorry if I didn't answer to all the It's okay. There will be time for conversation over coffee as well. So let's uh, let's come to our next. Question. Should I answer all questions? You can answer whatever you would like uh, because, to answer. Because of the time constraint.
I mean, maybe chill to one. So okay. You're, okay. You want thank to you. Race to the room yeah, yeah. And again, over coffee, you know, we can have okay, more conversations. We're yeah. here for the day. So. Okay. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the interesting questions. Um, thank you, Hilary, because you pinpointed this is something we are struggling with as we are developing with the research. Uh, let, let me give us a little background. We have published an article with uh, the Journal of the Royal Irish Academy where we uh, compared and contrast Greece and Ireland during the 2008 uh, Eurozone crisis. And uh, there our methodological tool was uh, neoclassical realism. Uh, after doing this research, we said, okay, let's expand and let's include uh, Cyprus, which is a microstate, and let's include, include also Iceland, who does not belong in the... Uh, this way I can address uh, several questions at the same time. As Professor Barry um, uh, noted, uh, Iceland does not uh, belong to the European Union, but belongs to the European Economic Area and it's a, an economy that is very close to the other small states economies that belong to the Eurozone and uh, constantly interacts with them. Also, its economy depends on the EU. Uh, so let's see whether those vulnerabilities were because those countries belonged to the Eurozone and let's include Iceland that does not belong to the Eurozone but uh, uh, it does not belong to the Eurozone. No, 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 I'm just listening to you. I'm just looking at Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's see if actually it's a structural problem of the EU or if it's a structural problem of small states that um, they're in the same category. That's why I said uh, uh, later in the PowerPoint, structure versus size. And uh, uh, so the research question is to see how small states in general despite their affiliation officially with an institutional structure, can become agents of change and innovation. And if they're affiliated with an institutional structure, how this impacts the structure as a whole to become this structure an agent of change and innovation? Because basically what we're seeing here is small global states, and for us, this is the only way for the EU to expand its geopolitical footprint and become a global actor. I'm sorry, become a, a global power. Uh, so through its parts, I don't know if I'm answering uh, the question. So the research question is this, and we're examining it uh, from uh, the case studies of uh, three uh, states that belong to the Eurozone and uh, a state that does not belong to the Eurozone. Have I answered your question? Uh, but um, uh, you, you can give me more suggestions. Sure. I would appreciate that because you can also guide us. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so this way I also answered Professor Barry's uh, question about why we chose, it seemed, uh, random. Uh, then a Kiryakos uh, question was, uh, it is unclear whether per purpose... Um, okay, yes, we are trying to rank them, not exactly rank them, but see those characteristics ac according to those factors. And this way there will be a ranking and also we will see the reaction of the EU and other institutions. And I'm coming to Carolina's question. Yes, it's broader. Because, for example, in the Eurozone crisis, we saw that it wasn't just the EU uh, institutions that were involved. It was involved Troika that included International Monetary Fund and other institutions. And in this day and age, right now with the stagflation and the war in Ukraine, you cannot say uh, the European uh, institutions, uh, institutional structure, it's broader. Uh, in, inherently because it connects with so many actors, uh, non-state actors, uh, other agreements uh, on all levels uh, with other parts of the world. Uh, we see, like for example, uh, the interconnection that are developing with ASEAN right now and how this affects European economy. So it's broader uh, by, by design and the way, uh, by, uh, because of multilateralism, right? Um, so, and just to honor Professor Tobias, uh, who honored us with his presence, uh, yes, uh, in order to build the resilience, because that's, uh, what, I guess this was his art argument, uh, that Israel was able to develop quick strategies in order to build the resilience. So this is what we are trying to do with the study as well. Uh, you need, in order to prevent crisis, to develop a quick risk management uh, strategy. 
Uh, Israel is a perfect example. Uh, Israel is doing this on all fronts, especially in the security sector. In our case, how can we do that in economic governance? Uh, and why is that? Because we have Greece that is constantly lagging behind, that it cannot get the lessons learned from Ireland, Iceland, uh, other small states. Why is Greece uh, uh, it cannot take these lessons learned? So is this a structural problem in the Eurozone or is this something that we should treat small states uh, individually? Then how, if we treat them individually and they become parts of a broader whole, then why they come and they create these interconnections and interdependencies? So I'm not sure if I... Uh, oh, and, uh, and Eduardo's uh, question. Um, about uh, what kind of filter we choose to... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, how do we understand uh, organizational structure? Yes, it's uh, wider. Um, I'm sorry, Eduardo, could you please... Have I answered your question? Could you please... Uh, in the coffee, thank you so much, and I apologize. Uh, actually, an announcement, first of all. Yeah. Uh, we shall convene for next session, not at 12.30, at 12.35. Just some time for okay. So uh, to close this panel, um, thank you to, to all three of our speakers. We talked a lot about you know, who we seek shelter from, when we seek it, is it an evolution, is it in times of crisis, what drives it, is it economic benefit, leadership, partners, all of this together. And we raised quite a few questions for the future on methodology, on areas for future research. Uh, I'm very sorry that we did not have a chance oh, to come to your okay. case study, okay. but hopefully at some point in the day, everybody yeah, talked yeah. to us That's where the, the secret information about the case study. <laughs> Thank you all for all your questions. I'm sorry I'm on Mediterranean time. I'm not very good at keeping to time, which I think I can say as a Maltese person. So um, thank you all for, for your attention to the coffee. And thank you for this excellent work as uh, chair. <laughs> Uh, I think they've, they've connected it. Okay, so let's start now, call to two, so we'll uh, try to end by um, two o'clock. Uh, first of all, let me thank the, the host institution and the organizers with whom I have the privilege of working for now quite a few years, so I, I know how nice it is to be here, and I'm sure you appreciate how nice it is to be here. Uh, today, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, what we are trying to do with this panel is uh, we are trying to link two uh, different academic uh, literature. The one that you are all familiar with, the, the reason you are here is small states and microstates. So I'm not going to go into that. But, and this is the whole point of the panel, we are trying to link it with something that we've been working on for some time now. Uh, and this is uh, parliamentary diplomacy. So we would like, we, I've, I've asked for the speakers for 15 minutes we, because we want your feedback. We want you to listen to us, but we want your feedback. It is vital to our research project. And so uh, I will not uh, say anything more than uh, you have the names and the, the associations and uh, the titles in the program. Uh, we will follow the order. And so please, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stelius. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, organizers, uh, Adalompo, Sethi, and everyone else involved, because uh, I know what these workshops, how much time they take. And uh, secondly, I want to thank the, the Institute, because every time I come to Wettins, it, it is a very uh, inspiring moment. These workshops, I give them much more importance sometimes and conferences, uh, because there are lots of papers, lots of direct contacts, and I go back full of ideas, uh, full of corrections to my own thinking, and uh, full of high hopes. And then I managed to do one thing wrong from all the things I gather in this. <laughs> uh, uh, and this paper is uh, has, has a long gestation period. We started off uh, somewhere in 2018, I think, it was uh, my last participation here. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, what happened? 
2019 and uh, 20, all hell broke loose, mm. and uh, we, we 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 could not meet. This was shelved, and I returned to it after some time. Uh, and it is about uh, small states uh, of Europe. Now, uh, the first thing that I did was to to uh, what I'm doing in this research, which is still a work in progress, is to set myself. Uh, a few questions, that is, uh, some basic research questions, that is, what kind of parliamentary di diplomacy is this group of, uh, of European states involved in? How did they become involved in this uh, activity? What was the main cause, the cause of, of this diplomacy? What objectives do they seek to achieve? In effect, do their annual parliamentary conferences lead to meaningful results? Because we have to test whether this parliamentary uh, diplomacy is taking us anywhere and what the results are and what is li the likely future of the parliamentary diplomacy of small states. I, I am referring to small European states uh, in my, in my uh, research. And, um, right, and these are the states I, I am looking at. Uh, they are too small for you to see, perhaps. Uh, so um, basically I'm looking at Cyprus. Estonia, I, I've included Estonia in this group, but I will exclude it later on. First I bring them in, then I throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you why. Uh, uh, the Luxembourg and Malta. So first I created the picture of what are the um, small states, European states. And I take the definition which is adopted by the World Bank and the, um, the, the Commonwealth, which is 1.5 million or less for small states and um, uh, 200,000 or less for the for the uh, micro states i include iceland of course which is a member of the uh, european economic area uh, liechtenstein montenegro which is a, a an african state andorra monaco san marino and at the bottom i i place surprisingly uh, uh, the vatican uh, why? Why is the the Vatican is intriguing because it's a it's a monarchical state. It is a, certainly not a, a a democracy, but it has a lot of uh, influence in the world as a, as a diploma in diplomacy in the values that it uh, not all of them. Eh? There are some values which which I would rather not speak about here, but it certainly is a. A projector of norms of uh, peaceful coexistence of uh, and of conflict by peaceful means and and uh, newer just order and lately from five years lately they uh, a big proponent of climate change uh, mitigation so uh, I think but still I won't uh, after bringing him in uh, to this uh, diagram then I throw them out again because I'm, I'm going to uh, focus um, one, the European states, which participate in the conference of speakers of parliament of parliament of the European small states. There, there are these are mainly uh, Cyprus, Luxembourg, Malta, Iceland, Liechtenstein, uh, Montenegro, Andorra, Monaco, and San Marino. And uh, the um, so far the the um, uh, what have I done? Uh, basically, I have collected the um, uh, quite a lot of information of all the conferences that have been uh, uh, held since the initiative started in 2007 by Monaco. And I've tried from this to uh, elicit some, some kind of trusts. Where are they going? What kind of, what are they seeking to uh, to achieve from these annual meetings. Um, I managed to put together all the documents of all the conferences which were organized, which was a Herculean uh, task because I had to contact each parliament uh, individually. It took me lots of, of months of not writing. Uh, uh, an email is quickly written, but the reply uh, comes after a few days. But anyhow, Bit by bit, I managed to cover all the uh, final declarations to gather them in a single uh, workable document, which I intend to share eventually uh, for those who don't have it. 
and um, also to um, to see to try to start the first analysis of uh, what they are trying to achieve so um, the um, the aims of the parliamentary diplomacy as is stated in these documents is the the, the first uh, that they are all uh, have a common membership these countries of the council of europe and they have an adherence to uh, democracy and human rights and uh, of course to uh, need to strengthen the mutual understanding to uh, pursue common interests promote synergies and cooperation this is the, the the first one of the first common aim that comes recurrently in these uh, in this documentation they agree that they can make a significant contribution in their respective countries' international relations, both via parliamentary control of government policies, including foreign policy, as well as to the active exercise of parliamentary diplomacy. So they actually mentioned parliamentary diplomacy as one of the uh, important uh, uh, activities of, of meeting. Um, the parliaments also want to double their efforts at capacity building. Um, we, the, this is uh, something uh, important for small state parliaments because uh, of their lack of resources. This, despite the, uh, the, the great strides that have been made in recent years of uh, the increase of IT and, and forms of gathering information, uh, parliaments, uh, small parliaments, capacity uh, both in terms of of people of MPs and very often in terms of of um, um, in terms of support the, the support which you, uh, you you need to have behind the scenes to uh, facilitate the parliamentary work and research um, they recognize the significant role of parliamentary diplomacy on an increasingly in their dependent groups global stage in enhancing closer and uh, more uh, regular contacts among parliamentarians mutual bilateral understanding and increased democratic legitimacy for intergovernmental institutions they claim that national parliaments could play a bridge building role in preservation of international peace and the parliaments agreed that in challenging times they were facing, it was important to strengthen parliamentary diplomacy through in-person or other forms of interparliamentary cooperation. Now, these are the declaration of aims. Now we're going to hold them to account. Now the research must go into uh, the facts, the empirical part, which I have not even started, uh, to see how much of this is uh, is, is being implemented in fact um, the self-adopted uh, uh, objectives are sharing experiences um, the uh, uh, sharing experiences in confronting domestic challenges they are uh, small states recognize they have special problems as small states special challenges so they share experiences in that cooperation to improve how they can improve uh, parliamentary capacity and uh, building together a community of practice. I found this very interesting. Alignment of their positions in international organizations, which is very uh, uh, important, very challenging. But remember that in international organizations, small states are uh, constitute very often formally a single as much uh, don't have the power but uh, a vote just like any other state and my question here would be do the, are these 10 small european states cooperating in international organizations of common membership and forming some kind of of block to achieve the um, an informal block of course to achieve the the objectives which they proclaim uh, confronting international crises such as the financial crisis and COVID-19 pandemic and dealing with the newer security challenges uh, such as cyber security, climate change and energy supply. These are some of the uh, objectives which they, which they declare in their declarations. Uh, 
I, I think the European small states emphasize their lack of power gives them more credibility when voicing their positions in international affairs. They are self-conscious of this. They have agreed on common stands during the most recent world crisis, such as the Arab Spring, the financial crisis, Great Recession, COVID-19, and lately Russia's war with the Ukraine. And in their annual uh, conferences, they have discussed the economic specificities of uh, small states, key economic sectors, such as tourism, and how to help each other strengthen their parliamentary capacities. How far has this economic dialogue gone? Uh, I don't have the impression that it has done much, but it's uh, something which has been started, uh, started by Monaco, by, by the way, and now we have to see uh, how far they have advanced in this. So looking ahead, the, Europe, the research on European small states on which um, the, uh, the, the, on which this paper has made a start has some gaps which need to be filled up in, in, in the future by research. Uh, the bilateral relations of these states are not all that clear and more work is required on how they relate to other parliaments, say through the creation of friendship groups. Many of them um, have friendship groups, others do not have. Uh, for example, Liechtenstein has only um, uh, two friendship groups, friendship groups, one with uh, Switzerland and one with Austria. Uh, how would you explain that? It's explained by reference to the capacity of the of the parliaments. But how effective are the friendship groups in bilateral relations of other parliaments? And are they related to size or size alone, the capacity? Because uh, something which I have not said in this presentation is that some of these parliaments are what we call the traditional parla uh, part-time parliaments. Uh, the Maltese parliament, for example, and even that of Liechtenstein and a couple of other countries in this group are part-timers. That is, the MPs hold a job and then in the evening they normally or in parliamentary sessions, they attend parliamentary sessions. They, they leave their job and, um, uh, and go to attend parliament. Uh, so they are part-time politicians, which also uh, has important repercussions on the effort, the, 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 the effort of the parliament. Uh, to cope with certain uh, aspects. And uh, also the issue of, of administrations and capacity building within parliaments, that is the support which uh, parliamentarians expect. I mean, Iceland has a very, uh, 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 as a small country, as the uh, Baldur here would, would vouch to this, there is the, uh, the uh, substitute MPs along with the with the MPs who, who are able to take on the flag when whenever an MP is unable to to uh, to execute his duties for some reason and uh, but there is other forms of support in in, in many parliaments uh, to do research for example and, and help the parliamentarians which uh, are very important to explore and some parliaments are too small have not developed these, uh, the, the, these capacities and need to develop them in the future. Um, so, um, the, uh, I, looking ahead, I'm still to, uh, still to be elaborated. Further are the relations of these small parliaments with their neighboring regions and the regional parliaments, the uh, paradiplomacy, whether paradiplomacy makes sense. For example, uh, I know that the uh, Maltese um, Parliament has tried to reach out to the Parliament of the region of Sicily, for example, which, which are huge parliaments. And uh, by, by our standards, I mean, Sicily, Sicily's population and the territorial size is, is, is much bigger than our country. And uh, whether there is uh, uh, fresh horizons to be uh, uh, explored between national parliaments as such and uh, regional parliaments, and um, then I, uh, taking the cue from some of the uh, articles, recent articles, particularly one article by uh, Stelio Stavridis, which I have quoted in my paper, I uh, set some questions for further research. And this is where I end my presentation. What criteria do the European small states 
uh, employ in choosing the initiatives they participate in, uh, what happens with the final declarations adopted at the annual conferences of the European small states presidents and speakers of parliament, do governments heed the conference's conclusions and work them into their policy processes? Can we find examples where interparliamentary sharing of information and practices led to successful policy changes? Has the parliamentary diplomacy of small states led to increased coherence and activism of the small European states in international organization? Or has life continued as, as before? Does the sample show a general or broadly shared behavioral pattern in the way they approach parliamentary diplomacy? Should the small states of Europe consider parliamentary <coughs> diplomacy with regional legislative assemblies or parliaments para diplomacy, given the growing importance of regional parliaments and the interactions which small states have geo with geographically proximate sub subnational regions, for example? Um, the Andorra and uh, Catalonia, for example, uh, there is interaction between them. Uh, th this is one example. Should we um, consider this as a very, uh, uh, you know, as uh, as an area to be explored in the analysis? And uh, my last, um, my last uh, thank you to you is accompanied by uh, 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 a picture of our mm -hmm. Parliament. Of course, this has been designed by uh, uh, designed by Renzo Piano, the famous Italian architect, and it is the most important, valuable thing about this parliament. We will uh, all the questions that he asked at the end. You have to answer them. In a brief before going to lunch, so don't forget about it. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Jyoti Chukla, um, is going to talk about microstates. And I will only mention, as I said, all the affiliation, everything is in the program. I will only mention that we have the privilege of having a former member of the parliament and a former senator, uh, in addition to being an academic. Um, so it's interesting that we have a practitioner who then decides to go into academia to work on what he was working before as a practitioner. And this is a bigger advantage for a new areas of research like parliamentary diplomacy. So Jody, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's an honor to be, to be here. And really, it's better to confess from the beginning that I had a previous life in the practical political life. And when I decided to return to the academy, I decided to add to my experience as a lawyer a new experience as a political science or international relations. And one of my topics is uh, parliamentary diplomacy. No, not the main topic, one, one of my topics. And I didn't comment before with Professor Pache, but I will present something in common with your, with your paper. And I decided to study uh, three cases uh, in alphabetic order, Andorra, Monaco and San Marino. Why? Uh, they have in common that they are micro-states, they are fully surrounded by European Union land, and the three micro-states are in talks with European Union in order to find a political and economical agreement without political will to become a member state of European Union. They didn't uh, present the application to member state of European Union, but they want to be uh, in this condition of uh, association agreement in economical and political and political terms. This is the case to study <coughs> these three states. I decided to put the focus in the Council of Europe because we will see how is the involvement and the intensity of the microstates activity in one of these international organizations. Secondly, because I had been member of Council of Europe for Parliamentary Assembly for 11 years, and I know better than other international uh, organizations. 
is in the paper, is not in the slides, uh, but maybe it's important to point out that the presence of microstates in international organizations had a very critical momentum in 1965. In 1965, uh, Iceland, Malta, and Jamaica became member of the United Nations without, apparently, without discussion. At the same year, Maldives present application and is a relevant debate in the Security Council. At the end of the day, Security Council decided to adopt and to accept Maldives as a member of the United Nations, but at the same time, in the same resolutions, sent to a committee of experts, a panel of experts, and a study about the role of the very small states in the United Nations. And frankly speaking, is one of the shame pages of the history of United Nations, United Nations, when we can find some documents and papers from US and UK with the recommendation to move these very small states to associate the states without the condition, without the right to vote and without seat in the uh, assembly of United Nations. At the end of the day, the legal committee of United Nations clearly opposed to this and say this is against the chapter of foundation of United Nations. I mention this because without these all discussions in United Nations was impossible to present now the involvement of these countries in several international organizations. Oh, sorry. This is the slide for tomorrow. No, 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 no. This is the slide for tomorrow. Sorry. <laughs> I started <laughs> because the first. Sorry, see. It's a preview. The, the, sorry. sorry, what I said is the same. <laughs> sorry. It's looking what you said is not the exact opposite of what you want to say tomorrow. Now, okay, thank you. Sorry for this. Sorry for this. Sorry, I, I started with passion with my speech, <laughs> without attention. Okay. So, this is the involvement of parliamentary diplomacy of microstates in these three cases, and especially in, no, in Mr. Professor Pache, in PASSE, it means Parliamentary Assembly of Council of it. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. It also means peace. But you will appear, you will appear <laughs> in these slides. <laughs> well, the methodology is the case, content analysis, uh, the web page of Council of Europe is extremely useful in order to study your member states and the activity of your MPs in PASSE and in deep interviews with former parliamentarians and colleagues. The hypothesis, these micro states tend to use the Parliamentary Assembly of International Organizations as a tool to improve their projections and <coughs> Uh, relevant role international relations. We'll see if this happens or not. In the case of PACE, the microstates study tend to appoint parliamentarians with extensive political experience in the legislative and executive branch. We'll see. In the case of PACE, the parliamentarians who are members of these delegations take uh, positions, relevant positions, in proportion of the population. We'll, we'll see. About Andorra, too much uh, uh, words, but I want to point out about Andorra just that Andorra have a constitution only in 1993 after a long diplomatic pressure from uh, external exogenous, external actors, but this is the paper of tomorrow, so I stop here. And maybe it's interesting to point out that uh, Andorra is a member of the Assembly of Francophonie since 1983, uh, ten years before this deep reform of the Constitution. Uh, before the Constitution, Andorra was almost, this is a little bit an informal, in the Middle Age structure, in terms of fundamental rights, so on. We'll, we'll see tomorrow. 
And then uh, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Andorra, Professor Julie Minovas, who is now teaching in the US, decided something not risky but peculiar in 2005 to present application for the Ibero-American summits. Andorra, this is a small country in the mountains, in the Pyrenees, has a member of the Ibero-American community with Spain, Portugal and all the Central and South American countries. It was a smart diplomacy, not soft diplomacy, a very smart diplomacy. It was not easy and with one consequence is that plus Spanish and Portuguese, Catalan became the uh, official language of these of this summits. And then, sorry because it's difficult to read, but this is part of my work, uh, artis artisanal work in this paper. The members since the accession until now, until today, of each state in PASSE, and the work of these people in PASSE. We will see Andorra, we will see Monaco, we will see uh, San Marino with different approaches. For instance, I don't want to comment one to one, but before the position in the government, Mr. Bartomeu, who was a part-time politician, is a lawyer in Andorra, produced nine reports in the Council of Europe, relevant reports, a convention in the fight against corruption, prevention of terrorism, the criminalization of blasphemy, impact of blasphemy in religion identity, so on, so on. So, a parliamentarian from a very micro state became a place, a relevant role in the parliamentary assembly. The Minister of Health, uh, Sylvia Bonnet, after being Minister of Health, produced four reports about uh, health matters in all the 47 member states, or for instance, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Marichel Batet, became general reporter of the, on the abolition of death penalty in the Assembly, from a very small country, took this relevant position. And then we see this man, Enrique Palmigiabilla, who produced only one report, but this report is about the accession of Mexico, more than 100 million of habitants, has a full member observer in Council of Europe. So how a part-time politician from a very small country with good connections with Mexico plays the role of a reporter, has a reporter of the accession of Mexico, has a permanent observer in the Venice Commission and in the Assembly. Monaco. Uh, about Monaco, uh, Monaco is the smaller microstate. If we take into account the Vatican don call for elections every four or five years. The smaller country is Monaco. Uh, uh, I think that it's important to point out that Monaco is member of COSAC. This is exceptional. COSAC is the two times per year meeting of the committees of foreign of European affairs of the member states of the European Union with the European Parliament. And Monaco Parliament is invited, no Andorra, no San Marino, but Monaco Parliament is uh, invited. About the activity, over about the 21 members, five members have been authors of reports and um, uh, legal opinions. Jean Charles Alabena didn't produce reports, but he was very instrumental in the conclusion of the post monitoring of Monaco. Tomorrow I will come back to this. Jose Badia, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Minister of Public Works, became member of the Assembly. And this case is very relevant, very peculiar. Brigitte Bocono Pages now is the Speaker of the Parliament. Sorry, in Monaco, the head of the Prime Minister is appointed by the Prince. It means that the highest positions by elections is the President of the Parliament. And this lady was Vice President, then President, and was at the same time President of the Parliament, a member of the Parliamentary, International Parliamentary Assembly, and in February this year, this lady leads 
the electoral list who wins 24 over 24 seats in the parliament. But uh, the most peculiar case is the case of uh, Jean Charles Gardetto. I jump directly to the Gardetto's case because I am in the border of the, my 15 minutes. Mr. Gardetto is a lawyer in Monaco, a part-time politician. He was a member of the parliament for two terms, his five years terms, ten years, and he was for ten years member of the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. In this time, in the Council of Europe, he led the electoral, the electoral, no, electoral, the political observation mission in Montenegro for the referendum of independence of Montenegro in May 2006. He was the reporter for the accession of Montenegro as a full member of the Council of Europe. And he was the co-reporter for the monitoring of Montenegro for four years and a half, together with Holovati, now the Vice President of the Constitutional Court in Ukraine, and with Nursuna Memerchan, former MP in Turkey, now who is living in the US because he is not uh, in line with Mr. Erdogan. I want to say with this, that this man, lawyer, from voted in a sense of 8,000 people, play a very important role in the Parliamentary Assembly. He was the reporter of the two reports about Arab Springs and the Arab Spring in Egypt, and you see in the in the paper and in this slide another reports important about the protection of children. And the question here is. This activity of Mr. Gardetto is under distraction or under a strategy of the Monaco government or the Monaco parliament or the Monaco uh, delegation? I will answer this uh, in my conclusions. I move to the last one. The Republic of San Marino. The Republic of San Marino has a parliament of 60 members, not very small parliament. And about PAM, PAM is a very interesting parliamentary assembly because it's founded in Nauplia, Nauplius, sorry for my pronunciation. Now it's based in La Valeta, in Malta. And all of these three microstates are members of PAM, uh, parliamentary assembly, but uh, without C. Monaco have C, but not Andorra and not San Marino. But they are, Monaco is a member as well of the parliamentary assembly of the Union for the Mediterranean. You will see a very different uh, result of my investigation in San Marino. Since the accession of San Marino in 1998 until today, San Marino had 39 members in passe. Zero, no one of them has been reporter of one uh, report in the assembly. So about Productivity about production in compared with Monaco and Gardetto's case. That, that Gardetto's, Gardetto was much more popular than the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Monaco in the international arena in Montenegro, no? if I may to say this. So, in terms of production, San Marino have a very poor production. One of these members, Roger Savoli, was president of one political group, so this is the exception. Free Democrats, but in the other hand, on the other hand, sorry, about the visibility and the role of these members of this delegation, what happened? It's very difficult to read because it's very small, but it's necessary here, sorry for overtake, the, yes. The heads of states in San Marino, under the inspiration of the Roman Empire, the idea of the Senate, and the consulates are members of the parliament elected every six months among parliamentarians. So, first day of October and first day of April, the parliament elect a new head of states, two captain regents, among parliamentarians. It means that a long list of members of delegations were during the political career head of states and member of the parliamentarian delegations. 
and uh, several members were at the same time or in the political career ministers and members of the delegation. More precisely, this is the figures. Knighting heaven, captain regent, head of states, a member of the government. But this is the figures. And I want to stop here for a moment. Because in the article, you have the link to the video on YouTube. Uh, Lorella Stefanelli, in January 2016, was at the same time member of the parliamentary delegation in Council of Europe vice president of the popular group in the Council of Europe and head of the state. And you can see in the video that he take together with Nicola Renzi, who was a member of the delegation. And you can see in the video has, he took the floor, has a head of a state with all the protocol and the, all the formalities of the head of the state. And he was at the same time a part-time politician, a member of the delegation and uh, head of the states. My conclusions. This is an Gardetos case and Bartomeu, sorry, I didn't mention that Bartomeu, Andorran parliamentarian, became prime minister of Andorra after these nine reports in the Council of Europe. This is the result of a, a smart strategy of the states, well, Usually the state support these parliamentarians, but this is the conclusion that is even my experience in the parliament, international parliamentary assemblies. We can say this is not right in the paper because I think that this is too much informal to say this, but the behavior is some kind of free riders parliamentarian. No? The individual initiative is very relevant in these cases. So we can validate partially or totally the hypothesis. And in the rank of activities, Monaco has the highest activity in the international arena. Just one figure. Monaco has 24 members in the parliament. Over 24 members in the parliament, 17 members are members of international delegations and members of some international parliamentary forum. So, means the involvement of this. And you saw San Marino have a very poor activity in international organizations, but the people who sent are relevant even head of states. And you can read just these conclusions uh, in more precise details. Thank you very much. Remain at this. Okay. Sorry. We have a paper by Laura Hill Mesada from the University of Luxembourg, and we are going. To, she's going to talk about Luxembourg. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you there to to the Institute of International Economic Relations for organizing this, to Dr. Stavridis also for the panel. And you know, you've seen here that I have adapted the, the title slightly towards in the program. So the parliamentary activities of a small state in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, using Luxembourg's parliamentary diplomacy, yes, but also Luxembourg's political parties. And you know, what I'm gonna present is not only a working paper, it's also part of my doctoral research. It's like, will be one of the Kind of chapters in my thesis, in a sense, which I'm doing at the University of Luxembourg and the Complutense University in Madrid. And uh, I am here missing a couple of uh, interviews that will, I will conduct uh, in two, three weeks uh, with the parliamentarians in Luxembourg, which will hopefully also like give more insights, like uh, behind the behind the curtains, in a sense. And you know, something fun is that I arrived to smaller states almost by coincidence, in the sense that I was doing parliamentary diplomacy for Spain towards Latin America. And then I, I was living in Luxembourg and I was like, hey, let's see what there is in the Luxembourgish parliament. And there's nothing. There's a lot on Luxembourgish parliament as in the functioning and the laws and the, the judicial control, etc., the constitutionality, but not on the diplomacy of the international, international relations of it. So that's why I became interested in it. I am currently actually working on 
a paper on the uh, general parliamentary diplomacy of the Chamber of Deputies of Luxembourg. What I'm going to present here is like a very precise case, but uh, I think it should be very interesting to do something much more generic because Luxembourg today has been, in a sense, mostly studied within other countries. Like Professor Patz's uh, study, for example, like comparing Luxembourg to Monaco to Liechtenstein, etc., and uh, not as a standalone. So I think that Luxembourg is a very interesting case because it's one of the uh, well, a small, it's the smallest EU country and it has the third biggest, highest GDP in the world. Which, I mean, of course, these kind of numbers are also all, always able to be. Uh, complicated in a sense, because the third high GDP, well, that can be fudged sometimes. But, you know, it has a surprising amount of high level parliamentary activities, meetings, parliamentary diplomacy for its size. Like even without the parliament, if we see, for example, the European Commission, the latest uh, 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 presence of the European Commission, such as Juncker, for example, there were quite a few that were Luxembourgers. So for its size, Luxembourg is taking quite a significant uh, role. So what I would like to explore in this paper is the question you got there. So to what extent have international activities and foreign policy essences of political parties in Luxembourg's Chamber of Deputies exhibited consensus uh, and cohesion to date with regards to the war in, in Ukraine? And I became interested in political parties because of paper I was by writing, I'm writing with Professor uh, with Dr. Stavridis on precisely Unidas Podemos, so the Spanish left-wing party, and Ukraine. And I was thinking, so Luxembourg has a culture, a political culture based on consensus, based on agreements. Are the extremes in Luxembourg also going to exhibit this much divergence from the mainstream parties, uh, as for example in Spain, within this topic of Ukraine? Well, I'm not going to bore you with the literature review, I don't have time for that. But uh, here is the, the political parties. In Luxembourg, well, you got uh, the Democratic parties, the standard liberal party, uh, in a sense, uh, market-oriented, individual freedoms, etc. You got the Socialist Party, the LSAT, you know, stereotypical Socialist Party, uh, center-left in general, social democracy, workers' rights, and so on. The Green Party, which, I mean, is green politics, ecology politics, and social justice. CSV, which is the well, belongs to the European People's Party. So, you know, you got the Christian democratic values, in a sense, center-right. Uh, you got the uh, Alternative Democratic Reform Party, which is the extreme right for Luxembourg, which is not extreme right, <laughs> because extreme right for Luxembourg is fairly tame compared to, for example, the extreme right in, in Spain or in many other countries. And you got the Pirate Party, which is tiny, it's like an alternative kind of party, and you got the left. So the left is um, socialist, anti-capitalist sent uh, sentiments, in a sense. So what have I done here? So I wanted to see to what extent uh, the, there is a consensus between the political parties and also which kind of diplomacy has there been. So I have kind of divided it between parliamentary diplomacy, at least the activities of the Luxembourgish parliamentarians outside of Luxembourg and parliamentary internal activities, such as, for example, the uh, voting records, the, uh, I have examined the parliamentary debates, the resolutions, the parliamentary questions, what has been done with regards to the war in Ukraine and how the political parties have reacted to it. To all that, of course, adding the outside uh, version of it, which is the parliamentary diplomacy itself, in a sense. So I was thinking this morning, maybe this is actually should be two papers instead of one, because you got the outside version, the diplomacy, and the inside version, internal activities. Anyway, I've never been very big on PowerPoints, I just like to leave them there, but I prefer to actually speak a bit, in a sense. So you see the parliamentary diplomacy, the diplomatic efforts. So the big standout moment is when President Volodymyr Zelensky came to the Luxembourgish Parliament in uh, June last year, three months after the start of the war. Luxembourg has 660,000 people. Why did an active president in a, in a country that is in a war right now uh, come to the, well, spoke uh, virtually in the Luxembourgish Parliament? Why did he take the time to speak to Luxembourg Parliament in a sense? Uh, that was, I mean, it was, very curious, in a sense, because Luxembourg, of course, hosts many EU institutions, etc. But there is, uh, after having a spoken informally in a conversation with a parliamentarian, granted, I would like to conduct an actual serious interview with him as well, uh, he affirmed it was because of the many Russian interests in, like, in the country. For example, Luxembourg is very big on hedge funds, uh, 
And uh, in, in two thirds of the hedge funds in Russia, in, in Luxembourg, there is Russian interests. So, you know, there has been quite a big push for sanctions and for, a, you know, both economic and energetic in Luxembourg towards Russian interest in a sense, because it has been kind of like a haven. So this parliamentarian very subtly implied this was the case. I would like to actually test this with a real actual research. And then afterwards, we got many other instances of uh, parliamentary diplomacy in Luxembourg. We see, for example, that Yves Kusten, who is a parliamentarian, is the deputy, is the president of the Commission of Foreign and European Affairs, visited Kiev uh, in October last year. And there he met, for example, the president of uh, the, Europe the, the Ukrainian parliament, uh, Ruslan Stefanchuk, also the mayor of Kiev. So in that sense, why, why did, you know, the president of the Ukrainian parliament in a country in active war meet a, you know, a tiny deputy of a tiny country in a sense. They discuss, among other things, Ukraine's integration into the European Union. And there, if Krusten was like, yes, we will actually support this. And this is something that Luxembourg uh, will support. In another paper I wrote precisely, I interviewed if Krusten, and he said that uh, maybe Luxembourg is not the best uh, the best uh, country to give ideas on how to integrate new members into the EU because Luxembourg is one of the founding members and therefore it that does not have uh, this many valid insights. But the fact is that Luxembourg parliamentarians have long participated in the uh, impasse, uh, in pace, in the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, in the Conference of Parliamentary Committees of Union Affairs, also in the OECE Parliamentary Assembly. And many of the uh, work towards Ukraine has been done within this, uh, within this sort of platforms. So, for example, the Conference of Parliamentary Committees for Union Affairs, the COSAC, is where this uh, Yves Krusten went to Kiev. And then you got, for example, Fernand Edgen, who is the current president of the Luxembourg Chamber of Deputies, also had another talk shortly after with uh, the president of the Ukrainian parliament, where they discussed military aid, uh, etc. Then shortly after as well, in February 23, uh, there were the, the deputy Gusti Grass from Luxembourg also participated in the OEC Parliamentary Assembly to, uh, to talk about the, the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine invasion and, you know, talking about judgment for war crimes, etc. So in that sense, also, well, in, we can, can continue if you want, but it's in April and then in May again. And, uh, and in, October this year, in, uh, in October this year, there will be again. So in that sense, Luxembourg has... Uh, Luxembourgish parliamentarians, within their limits, have taken a little bit of a very vested interest in having diplomatic efforts, uh, in having, uh, you know, relations with Ukrainian uh, parliamentarians and the president of the parliament and so on. And the interviews I will conduct, I will want to know why, why, I mean, what, why is that the case? This is, as I said, a working paper still, but that was interesting. I mean, of course, then we have the non-parliamentary side. For example, Prime Minister Xavier Bettel also visited Kiev, but so has so many other presidents or prime ministers of the governments. That's not parliamentary diplomacy in any case. And then we think, oh, sorry, I am almost done. Uh, and then we see, for example, uh, within the parliamentary activities, the internal activities and the political parties, within military and security support, for example, Luxembourg has uh, given to Ukraine 16% of its defense budget. Then again, 16% of the defense budget is 100 uh, million euros. It's not that much because it's Luxembourg we're talking about. But uh, here we see that within military and security support, both the center-right, the center-left, the Liberal Party, the Green Party, the Pirate Party, all of them have a very big consensus on, uh, on giving military aid to Ukraine. The two differences, are the extreme right and the extreme left. For example, the extreme right said that delivering lethal arms may extend the conflict, uh, but uh, in a parliamentary uh, debate, they stated that they would like to give non-lethal um, aid, such as demining um, operations. In that sense, the left, for example, said that they agree with shipping arms, but they would like to raise the topic of uh, the, the danger of having weapons, of giving weapons to the population. So in that sense, it's a very tame position for extreme uh, party, in a sense. In the economic uh, measures, then again, pretty much everyone agreed. The, you see the socialists, you see the center-right, you see the Greens, everyone has agreed with uh, the sanctions, the freezing of Russian assets, the uh, uh, etc. So in that sense, 
there is a consensus. Then with humanitarian measures in which I was uh, talking mostly about refugees and uh, donations of NGOs and uh, activism and so on, there is absolutely unanimous uh, views among all the political parties, which is interesting. And uh, you see the NATO and in NATO and European Union, everyone agrees with the exception to the left, which in general does not agree with NATO as a whole. So, you know, I'm going to just go to the conclusions because uh, Professor Stavridis is looking at me uh, meanly. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, in a sense, something I found very interesting in, in this working paper, and I would like to continue on, is the protagonism that Luxembourg has had in parliamentary diplomacy towards other, uh, towards Ukraine in this case. And I would like also to examine other conflicts, uh, recent and not so recent, to see whether it has been the case. Uh, why so many meetings? Why so... Uh, so many uh, well, possible establishments of cooperation, etc. as well. Within the political parties, I gotta say, it's not so novel, the results. We knew that Luxembourg has a consensus center political culture. We knew that the two extremes were not as extreme as the rest of the EU, uh, the EU extremes, and, uh, you know, that they are more tame in general. That's nothing unexpected in a sense. It's nice to see it uh, after having examined the voting records and the resolutions and the debates anyway. And when uh, Professor Patze and Professor Shukla were, were talking before, I was actually thinking it would be very nice to write a paper on whether small states favor, you know, more participation in parliamentary, in parliamentary assemblies uh, because it's one, is it one of the ways that they can actually make a difference, you know? So, for example, when I was talking to, uh, to one of the deputies of the Luxembourgish parliament, Yves Krusten, he said, you know, as a small Luxembourger that I am, I am not going to change the world here. But if I join the small Luxembourger with several small ones, we may actually do something. So this could actually be very interesting to research as well. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, Laura. Uh, the floor is now open. As I just said, uh, two speakers are looking forward to comments. We are looking forward to as much feedback as we could possibly, I can see Hilary already saying I'm here, okay. Uh, let me start from the back. Uh, just as Myers, I don't know, I've been in university, a small comment on the very last thought of, of, of Laura's presentation, where the small states prefer uh, parliamentary diplomacy. I think there is some intuitive Proof for that, for instance, you know, Lithuania has developed very good, I say, parliamentary diplomacy with the U.S. It has even established a special attaché for parliamentary diplomacy for Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the idea is that they bring constantly Lithuanian parliamentarians, they meet U.S. Congress. And the idea is that, you know, we cannot be Saudi Arabia, we cannot pump millions into their electoral campaigns. So we we constantly just use public diplomacy and pressure them to 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 to, to, to behave the way we like to be. So I think there is perspective uh, on, on, on this issue. Thank you. Before I can I just add to your comment that Lithuanian parliamentarians are on the blacklist of China for other reasons. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'm right. Thing. Yeah. And I think this is also another interesting case. You mentioned the United States, but you also mentioned, uh, mentioned China. Again, Lithuania, China, USA. And it's interesting that Lithuania has been targeted by China, the Lithuanian power has been targeted by China uh, for their criticism of Chinese uh, domestic policy, especially of minorities. But I think it's important because Lithuania is kind of the exception in the Baltic states in that sense. It appears like I don't know about the American connection, so that's very good. Thank you. Uh, Hilary, please. Uh, thank you. Thanks to all the presenters. I have a question for everybody. So, and I'll start with Professor Patch. Well, my first question is just a clarification question. I know this project is looking at European parliamentary diplomacy. Do you, um, are you looking at, for instance, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean as well, or are you also looking at parliamentarians through the EU? I just wasn't sure of the forum or all for and I, I mean you're because you're from Malta and I know Parliamentary Assembly of Mediterranean is based there I'm just wondering whether you're looking at that because of the access and the other question I have is 
um, you talked about a lot of their their commitment to uh, this community of practice and developing good behaviors, but we also know, and, and you spoke about some of the challenges and vulnerabilities of uh, small states domestically. So I, I don't know if you have an answer to this question, but is there a way for them to use parliamentary diplomacy to have better oversight of some of their own domestic challenges to try to shore up domestic uh, security and prevent clientelism and all of that kind of stuff. I know it's not exactly what your question is, it's just something I'm curious about from listening. And then um, uh, Dr. Shukla, um, you spoke about, I found your, your presentation very interesting and uh, just a comment you might be, when because lead, again leadership it seems to be quite a big theme when you were talking about Perdetto and, and his own dynamism. So I think you it might be helpful to look at Valerie Hudson's actor-specific theory, which looks at the role of individuals within contexts. It might be helpful. The, the questions it got me thinking are, is success in this context about the person or the structure or both? Um, and in, on what basis can we say can we differentiate in your points between being influential as opposed to active, right? And you gave some examples, I think, with the reports and things, but, you know, because we tend to say small states are very influential and sometimes we just mean they're very busy and very active. But if we're trying to see how can they be influential. And the last one is I thought your point about San Marino having the head of the same person who's head of state, part time politician, all of this. I just thought this was quite interesting to show some of the the strengths of small small bureaucracy that actually there's fewer layers of decision making maybe this is a strength in this case and then laura i, I thought your presentation is very interesting my my question is quite straightforward because you're asking why um you know why is luxembourg so actively engaged but um i in my head i'm thinking well eu institutions are based there so presumably that's also why zelensky went there and not just to, I don't know, but I assume it's not just because he wanted to go to Luxembourg, but because it's the site of the European financial institution. So to what extent does that uh, feature? Thank you. Professor, just a general comment or general question. Uh, when you were speaking, uh, what came to my mind is the concept of solidarity. Maybe it's difficult to measure, like uh, Hillary was saying, influence. We see that the states are active, there are active relations between them. They want to achieve certain things. But how simply is, is solidarity important? And, and then if solidarity among small states is important, how do we measure it? But it may be quite important in these bodies that Roderick is analyzing the press body of the presidents of the parliament of the states. It's not an influential body, but it may be, in, in, in relation to solidarity, it may be important. And then I was just wondering, did, for example, if you look at the recent crisis situation, like the last international financial crisis, or the COVID pandemic crisis, did these small states show its other extra solidarity? For example, did the other small states support Iceland in the IMF when Britain and the Netherlands blocked the assistance to Iceland? Or did then these diploma diplomatic relations not matter at all? Thank you. Thank you. Professor Tell me. Yes, it's also, I don't know if it is a comment or in general question, it's up to you if you'd like to answer. Uh, you mentioned the power of the powerless. Uh, I agree with you 100%. But and sometimes we have some issue in crisis situation, especially that small states or the threat of collapsing of security or even of economy of a small state is a tool for a small state to negotiate with other because the collapse of uh, would might, might have a negative spillover 
to uh, uh, the other, let's say, member states of the European Union or for uh, alliance, or even to a region. I have in my mind North Macedonia, for example, uh, which uh, uh, this was a pressure of, of to the others to come to assist North Macedonia. Uh, but the pants, uh, uh, in order to the survival of the state, is possible uh, is uh, to, uh, to to build up stability in the region. Otherwise, there will be a spillover effect. We have to look, I think, much more thoroughly and to find some case studies and study them in order to find out if uh, really. Uh, it is exactly the case, the power of the powers. Okay, thank you. Let's have the first responses. We'll let for the order. I, 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 oh, sorry. I, I was just thinking on what you were saying. What I said, sorry, in English, that's why I... Uh, yeah, uh, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> on the... No, at the, at the moment, Hillary, I'm just... Um, I took a panoramic view to establish where the uh, I I tried to chart where the uh, small state parliaments of, of of Europe, not the European Union, I include others uh, like uh, Iceland, which is a very close uh, country to us, member of the European Economic Area and uh, or candidate countries, and I excluded some. Uh, uh, European states, like I said, Estonia, which you know uh, has um, not um, it, it is not in the conference of the presidents of the small European states for that reason. Normally, it might be brought in because, as the research unfolds, as you know, it could take uh, new directions. And uh, I included the, the the Vatican, so I'm taking a very uh, comprehensive view. Um, and um, do small, but the more interesting question that you you ask is: Do small states use parliamentary diplomacy to have an oversight of their domestic institutions and so forth? Um, this is an interesting question. I I I, I will certainly include uh, uh, included in the in the research. Ah. Very interesting, because um, the uh, particularly the Council of Europe is a very important um, institution through um, quite a, a number of internal um, bodies within the Council of Europe, like the Venice Commission, for example, which um, has made important uh, constitutional and uh, democracy improvement uh, suggestions to all the, the, the states of the Council of Europe, particularly the micro states and small states, some of which are either newly independent or have only recently uh, acquired the constitution. Uh, so, uh, in the case, I, I know one case very well in the case of Malta, where when we had uh, uh, problems of democracy in the 1970s and 80s. Um, uh, which I'm glad Hillary does not remember any of them because you are not yet <laughs> around. Although I've studied. I am, <laughs> I am glad you didn't uh, live through those periods as I did. We did use uh, uh, the, the Council of Europe, the opposition parties did use the Council of Europe to bring to the attention of the Council of Europe that the uh, government uh, at the time uh, uh, was not living up to uh, institutions. I mean, uh, uh, somebody here has mentioned the case of Daphne Caruana Galizia uh, during the discussion, but in 1979 we had also the burning down of Malta's leading newspaper to the ground by supporters of the Socialist Party um, on a flimsy excuse, which was not true, that there had been an assassination attempt on on uh, Don Minto, who was the leader of the... And uh, we had uh, four or five assassinations during that period as well, of opponents to the government. And the Council of Europe served 
as a body where we, uh, the opposition, took the uh, this behavior there and said, look, is this country living up to the uh, uh, Council of Europe principles? And so that, that is one interesting case which uh, I know very well because I if to it myself, but but I have to look uh, around and see whether as well, it has been um, the uh, membership of international organizations has been in a sense weaponized, uh, weaponized in, in for want of better um, words to defend the institutions of democracy and, uh, and free speech. Uh, the concept of solidarity, yes, well, do it's a very interesting um, because. Uh, very interesting because if if these um, countries um, do not help each other in in matters like the in in institutions, international organizations, and so forth, um, we there is a problem because what is the aim of parliamentary diplomacy if it does not, not lead to some concerted action uh, at international level, at regional or international organizations? such as the IMF and so forth, when, when other countries, small countries are in trouble. And I, I will certainly make it a point uh, to, 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 to be further explored. And lastly, with, um, with the question by Professor Tsardinidis, um, it is a, a problem because these are the very small, I mean, I defined the small states according to the World, um, uh, World Bank and Commonwealth uh, um, definitions, and uh, to my mind, none of these uh, small states, except perhaps uh, in the case of Luxembourg, Cyprus, and Malta, because of their financial financial uh, centers, um, could uh, really um, <clears throat> have a lot of of, of uh, clout uh, to draw in the uh, members of the region region into into such. Um, into their own problems, you know, uh, come and save me, because if you don't, you're going to be hurt. They do have some, these three bigger country economies do have some some of that, but, but, but they, it's not, I mean, the proportions are so, so small, I mean, economically, that, that really, I, I don't think they, they are in a position to do that. A country like Greece is a, is a small country, by other definitions, and could do that because it it had some relevance to the survival of the euro, but certainly uh, not in our case. I mean, and that is why I think, going back to our previous conversation, that is why I think that Cyprus was treated so badly. You know, I mean, little twerp. What do you expect from us? You know, uh, with slam, slam, slam. Take care of your own problems. Uh, because it it is so insignificant uh, in terms of economics. Thank you. Before I pass it on to you, just to add to Hillary, although it's not small states, post US war in Iraq 2003, Italian parliamentarians wanted information about Italian troops. They couldn't get it through the parliament, they went to the British Parliament, the British Parliament got information from the British government and it came back to Rome. So this is a kind of networking at the parliamentary level that gives more information for each parliamentarian to better control uh, their government, which is part of... Uh, and this is... You are absolutely right, Mary, about the... There is a literature on the parliamentary control, and there is a literature on, on the parliamentary diplomacy, those two are not necessarily linked the way they should be in practice, and there that gives me the, the need to reform practitioner. You can think of new means because you live parliamentary life, and you can find ways around the structure, if you like. And I think this is important. The flexibility of parliamentary diplomacy or parliaments is always very important. The informality, the flexibility, the personal context, and then of course IT and the rest of it. Thank you, thank you, Julie, please. Yeah. Actually, contribution, I have a new idea to share with you, but uh, <laughs> we don't have. Well, Hilary, thank you for your comments and questions. And about the visibility and the importance of these micro-states, and the parliamentarians in the international organizations. 
what happened? Uh, the parliamentary, the Monaco, Andorra, and San Marino don't have MPs in the European Parliament. So, in front of the public opinion, the European debate passed through the representative of these countries in the Council of Europe and, and other international organizations. So, what some, what some MPs say in OSC Parliamentary Assembly, in the Union Interparliamentary Assembly, is much more relevant because this parliament, these countries don't be members and don't want to be members of the uh, European European Union. Secondly, about the real influence of these parliamentarians, I, I speak now about Council of Europe, but we can compare with OSC and other parliamentary assemblies. The Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, who started as a consultative body of the Council of Ministers, nowadays have real, real relevant powers, formal and informal. Formal. The election of judges of the European Court of Human Rights is a competence of the Assembly. A member of the Committee of Elections, and we provide a short list of three candidates and a recommendation. But at the end of the day, the vote of the judges, judges for seven years' term, it's a decision, it's a power of this assembly. The monitoring committee, it's working in, from 1997, tomorrow I will present in details, and the weak countries in the standards of democracy, human rights, and rule of law are under monitoring. And the full power to put one country under monitoring or put out this country under control is from the assembly. And this assembly is a secondary assembly of national representatives. This is formal powers. Informal powers, I move to Professor Pachi. This journalist, Galicia, I'm sorry that I don't can pronounce the full name of Caruana Galicia. Caruana Galicia case jumps to the Parliamentary Assembly through the report of a man, a very active man uh, from Netherlands, yes. Peter Omsik. Keep in mind this name because maybe this name will be the next Prime Minister of Netherlands because now he's not anymore member of the Christian Democrat Party and is leading a party who apparently for elections next month or in two months are leading the polls. In any case, Peter Omsik took the initiative and did a good report. The other phase of the coin is that sometimes the national agenda appears in the international assemblies with internal agenda. What I try to say, one of these Andorra uh, MPs, Pere Lopez, who was the leader of the Socialist Party in Andorra in the last electoral campaign, he was one of the two reporters about if in Turkey and in Spain exist political prisoners. What is behind this, the Catalan case, I am not here to talk about Catalan case, I am Catalan, Catalanist, I'm not independentist, but was truth and horror that the Socialist Party tried to avoid the report of Silevich from Lithuania, Latvia, sorry, was extremely supporting the independence movement. So sometimes it's very objective approach and sometimes it's a tricky strategies, but this is part of the agenda, the political agenda in the international and national parliaments. And the human factor and why the individual initiative is so important in the parliamentary service. For two reasons. First, the contact, the face-to-face -face relation in international organizations is much more important than the, the, the discipline of political parties. So, you are conservative or socialist, don't take matter about this, and you are green, but you can agree to support each other for a rapport because you have a good feelings and a good behaviors in your work and a constructive relation. Yes. Secondly, I had been, sorry for this personal comment, I had been for four years a president of a liberal group in the Council of Europe. I didn't appoint 
the member of my group in the electoral list in national parties. What I try to say. Less power. <laughs> it's in the national parliament, usually the people respect much more the instructions of the party because at the end of the day, the, we have different electoral systems, the British system, the constituency, the majoritarian system is different, but usually in the national parliaments, the vote, the discipline is highest than international organizations. Why? Because the parliamentary group in international organizations don't fix the election of the parliamentary. Last comment. Yes, Lorella Stefanelli was at the same time part-time politician, member of the delegation, vice president of one political group. Usually the head of the state is not a partisan member. And he was vice president of one parliamentarian group, at the same time head of a state. Just uh, one figure. Each of these countries, Monaco, uh, Andorra and San Marino, have two representatives and two substitutes in passing. And the substitutes have the full powers to, to produce rap reports. They have only to vote, but they can uh, alternative uh, ro do a rotation. What I try to say, Spain, we have 12 representatives and 12 substitutes, 46 million habitants. So in proportion, these small states, or the micro states, they have an over-representation, well, have a representation and they take advantage of this representation. And about coordination between micro states, I am a little bit pessimistic. And about the question from our colleague about coordination between micro states, if the interest are if they share interest, they they have good coordination, but if they have different interests, I am I, I, I am witness of opposite. Before I, I ask Laura to uh, close this, don't forget that you're between what you say and lunch. So please be as possible. Thank you, Dr. I will take comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I would like to answer to professor from Finland. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. But... And, uh, yeah, I would just like to say, like, for example, we were saying about uh, the small uh, states prefer parliamentary diplomacy, maybe within international parliamentary assemblies, maybe not. And what uh, Dr. Stavridis mentioned uh, about parliamentarians being targeted by China in Luxembourg, again, 660,000 people, out of whom only half of them are nationals, and out of whom only 200,000 people are electorate, there are several parliamentarians, both at the European Parliament, member of the European Parliament, and within the national parliament, who have uh, sanctions against them put by China. So, you know, this does lend credence, credibility, in a sense, to the fact that uh, Small states could um, have, I don't want to say some influence, but could be bothersome to much bigger powers, in a sense, because of human rights. For example, uh, Madame Isabel Bisler Lima, uh, she's a member of the European Parliament from Luxembourg. She works in human rights, in the Human Rights uh, Committee, and so on. And she is sanctioned herself, her husband, her daughter, uh, by China, precisely because of her work on that. So, you know, this kind of thing is interesting to study as well. And uh, in response to, to Hillary of, uh, you know, why is Luxembourg so actively engaged uh, within the, the war in Ukraine, is it because of the institu EU institutions based there? I mean, yes, for example, like uh, the, you could argue, I could argue, yes, that uh, Zelensky's uh, intervention in front of the Luxembourgish parliament could potentially be also due to the EU institutions, but the fact that Zelensky also talked in front of the European parliament itself already. So, I mean, I don't want to say it was like a double intervention because most of the interventions by President Zelensky were fairly similar in all aspects, you know, like less su economic support, financial support, uh, EU accession, etc. So, why doing it in the European Parliament and also the Luxembourgish Parliament? That's what I would like to know. And in, in that sense, I mean, we see the formal parliamentary diplomacy that Luxembourg did towards Ukraine, like, for example, uh, the interventions in front of the OECE Parliamentary Assembly and the NATO Parliamentary Assembly in different times about where they were speaking about Ukraine and so on. But then we also see the more informal bilateral things as well, like when if Krushten, the, the president of the Committee of European International Affairs, went to Kiev, 
and uh, and talked with the president of the Ukrainian parliament or when the president of the Luxembourgish parliament uh, talked to the president of the Ukrainian parliament twice. So is it because the institutions are there? I think that's, I mean, that may be a reason, but I think there are many others as well in that sense. And I would, wanted to ask some, add something also on the influence that you mentioned, because I found it interesting also when Dr. Shukla was answering, like the influence of parliamentary diplomacy, like is, I think is extremely difficult to measure. Like it was my first project for my doctoral thesis was on that. And now it's not that anymore. Like I, my thesis has changed uh, because it's extremely difficult uh, to measure in a sense with the interparliamentary activities and Stelios, I hope, because I learned this from you. So it's actually a danger to say this out loud because you are here. But I learned this from you in a sense that we see we have interparliamentary activities and we have parliamentary diplomacy, which is the relations, uh, the parliaments as, as international moral tribunes, etc. And we have the technical parliamentary cooperation. You know, for example, Spain has uh, multiple uh, workshops, seminars with Latin American countries in which they have, uh, they contribute to well, I don't want to say teaching, but to an exchange of ideas uh, on things like parliamentary transparency in election processes, in digitalization, etc. And we can actually see an influence there. Like, I don't, maybe not an influence like completely A because of B, but, you know, we can, you know, uh, map it in a sense, like from the different meetings, the conclusions, and how the internal parliamentary legislation has changed in places like, for example, the Dominican Republic after these sort of seminars. Now, in topics that are much, much, much larger, it's much more difficult because there is many more contextual clues that, uh, I mean, it's, it cannot only be appointed to a, a parliamentary uh, a meeting, but with things like technical parliamentary cooperation, I think it's more possible to map it. Thank you very much. I think we can bring this to the floor. Oh, do you, do, are you sure you want to be between lunch and... Uh, no, no, you, you can ask the question. You can ask the question. Okay, um, you can well, the question well let's, let's take it as a comment. Uh, okay. <laughs> No, it just it just struck me that the fact when you mentioned at the end the reason Cyprus was treated so badly was because it was small and insignificant. I mean, my memory of it is that Cyprus was treated badly and the banks that were less were less collapsed because there was an assumption that it was all Russian money and that they could they could be wiped out and it didn't wasn't EU citizens that were going to be affected it was Russian citizens. So that's my memory of the, the mistreatment of, of Cyprus. But it raised this other question, I mean, that only came to my mind afterwards, which is that there's another class of micro-states that have this, have this kind of shadowy existence in Europe, and they're the British dependencies, right, to grow up Isle of Man, Jersey, and so on. And like Cyprus, but like Iceland as well, at the time of the collapse, and perhaps Ireland to some extent, they pay, play a, an oversized role in the architecture of global finance. And they're able to get away with it, as I was talking to you yesterday, because they're so tiny, so people don't pay much attention to them. And I'm wondering, that, you know, this whole area of small state studies that I'm not really familiar with, whether it looks at that, I think that's it's a thing well worth looking at. Thank you, uh, pro Professor, if I may, uh, just now one comment. Uh, no, 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 I, just one, one minute. Uh, yeah, I mean, if sometimes the way we get around this, we uh, we um, we add small states and territories. If you include small territories, which is you know uh, a bit of uh, jingoism in my opinion, but we are we, you have to make a choice whether you are going to focus on states or uh, small states and small territories, which you can include them, bring them in into the in, in, into your studies. And uh, one last thing about Luxembourg, so I can't, I have a niche on this. Uh, where decisions are still taken by unanimity in the, in the European Union, particularly on membership uh, of new countries, enlargement, and the Ukraine is a, is, a, is a candidate country, it doesn't matter whether you are a big state or a small state, you have a constitutional process for the ratification of the accession treaty which has to go through and in some cases as in Ireland the referendum so small states have a great power 
on Huawei this provided to the Ukraine because it is taken in the CFSP context where there is unanimity and uh, also on the question of sanctions and on the question of enlargement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we started at 10 past, we finished at 12 past. I think we put it together. So, thank you very much and uh, have a good life. Thank you. Long introduction. Uh, we start now. Uh, it is on the relationship of small and middle. European powers with China. We, we get 15 minutes each is the correct for for the presentation. And uh, we we'll start with uh, Professor Marketos, correct? He yes. is a research assistant here on Eurasian energy geopolitics. I don't need to elaborate too much on 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 the importance of of, of this uh, particular panel, particularly now mm. that. Uh, you know, uh, China has come into the into the uh, vision even of the European Union in many ways in recent years. And uh, let me give the floor straight away to Professor Marketos to uh, to begin his presentation. Yes. Please, Professor. Uh, well, uh, as you see in uh, the title, uh, we're going to talk about Turkey. Because uh, I stress this because uh, for all this period before in uh, this uh, conference, we've been talking about small states. And now I, I think uh, it's time to talk about uh, a state that uh, in the Cold War was uh, considered to be a. a a medium importance uh, a country. Nowadays, it is uh, uh, for in Europe a, a big country, uh, but also aspires to become a middle power in the international system. So, uh, it, our point uh, is about Turkey's middle power pendulum, and uh, pre precisely, I'm going to, to try to explain how Turkey, using its initiative of middle corridor uh, in the energy and trade uh, sectors, uh, aspires to combine this uh, initiative with the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative of China in order to exert uh, influence in a quite big range of uh, peripheries in uh, Eurasia and uh, uh, a greater Middle East. Uh, as, as it is uh, widely known, uh, nowadays uh, we are living in a multipolar world where uh, Western and Eastern uh, actors uh, uh, are in a big struggle so as to uh, uh, so, so as to show themselves uh, more uh, competent, especially in Asia Pacific, Central Asia, South Caucasus, Southern and Eastern Asia, Central Eastern Europe, Middle East regions, and uh, various countries in the, the Eurasian continent. So the, the, this is a struggle uh, in which uh, uh, some fragile regions uh, like uh, Eastern uh, Europe, or like uh, Western uh, Balkans, um, uh, can face uh, proxy or total wars, like in Syria or Ukraine, where uh, and it is a, a system, international uh, system, uh, that evolves uh, progressively, and in which international norms and laws are uh, going to be interpreted in uh, different ways and uh, even uh, further important is to, to my view small and uh, medium states will not have the uh, um, uh, uh, will, will be forced to choose uh, between one of uh, the poles of the system 
for maintaining their security and uh, essentially a um, uh, force to, to join uh, or either the West or the Sino-Russian uh, uh, tandem. So uh, let's talk about so, Tur Turkey per se. Uh, uh, this, uh, the policy, the foreign policy that for uh, the last uh, 20 years President Erdogan is, uh, uh, is exercising uh, is uh, different uh, from uh, the previous Republican governments in Turkey and uh, it, it is uh, pursuing uh, uh, Turkey's ambition to gain the status of a middle power and under this aspiration uh, she, uh, she, uh, Turkey has uh, uh, has elaborated with uh, the Central uh, uh, Asian countries and Caucasus countries uh, Middle Corridor Initiative, whose objectives are, uh, as you see, uh, its um, uh, ambitions are uh, very very important, and uh, finally uh, there. Uh, the, the, in the end of all, it is uh, Turkey's vision to become a multi uh, 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 for uh, uh, Turkey's vision in an, in, in an evolving um, multipolar world, uh, where she wants to become one of the poles of the international system. Uh, um, in fact, questioning the world order. Uh, as it was constructed after World War II, and uh, <clears throat> more precisely uses its uh, the status of uh, the former uh, Ottoman um, Sultan as Khalifa of uh, the Uma, uh, the con uh, congregation of uh, believers, uh, to revoke in public world public opinion the injustice of refusing the Islamic world the right to be included as an equal partner and competitor in the foundation of the capitalist development of nowadays world and definition of uh, the ecumenical uh, uh, civilization. Uh, this is uh, uh, <clears throat> a, 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 uh, an instrumentalization uh, of uh, uh, the uh, 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 Turkish Eurasian ideology pursued by uh, President uh, Erdogan of uh, Turkey. Uh, I give you here a, a map of uh, the Middle Corridor as uh, I, it was uh, uh, presented uh, by various uh, uh, sources and uh, you can see um, how uh, Turkey wants to play the role of, 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 uh, of the bridge between Turkey and Europe vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the trade and uh, the transfer of energy between uh, these uh, two important economic uh, <clears throat> uh, poles of uh, international system. Uh, trying now to, to, to elaborate on Turkey's uh, 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 perception of, uh, of the state, the, the Turkish historical international role cannot be solely defined on the basis of Western modernity and the country's relation to the West, because uh, the Turkey uh, aspires to have a more complex identity, one that didn't refuse necessarily the West, but intended to differentiate itself from uh, uh, the West and position and have a position between East and West. Uh, this is uh, uh, can be seen in various uh, Turkish literature uh, with the notions of great Turkey, a state breach, etc. Uh, and in the governing uh, AKP party rhetoric, the Islamic government's uh, movement's anti-Westernism naturally allied to the Russian 
uh, uh, Eurasianism takes the shape of Islamic Eurasianism. And why Islamic? Because, uh, as I said, uh, Turkey wants to instrumentalize its own identity as a, a more Muslim country, so and its uh, history of, of of being an empire, Muslim empire, uh, to or, uh, to to or, or to de um, define a different path in its uh, future. Uh, so it. The Islamic Eurasianism, it is going to refer both on identity, history, and in, in the international context. Turkey wants to be considered a unique international system, all defined by concrete inter ideological, cultural, political, and economic characteristics. And <clears throat> as it is anti-Western, it uh, it points on a more Asiatic and Eurasianist international scope, uh, um, uh, trying to, to, to show that the, an Islamic culture proportion, uh, uh, promotion in international order decentralization it, uh, is very important and uh, used, uh, uh, although the West is definitely not annulated for Turkey's uh, foreign policy, nor abandoned. And uh, uh, Turkey is using what is most important, <clears throat> is using the organization of Turkic states <clears throat> as uh, to, uh, to achieve its uh, ends. And this is the organization of Turkic states. It is important that um, a country uh, um, having the energy and capabilities of, uh, uh, of Turkmenistan is now part of the organization of Turkic states. And to my view, it is also in interesting to see that Hungary uh, is an observer state uh, in this organization. <clears throat> so, uh, Nowadays, we have, uh, as you know, a war in Ukraine. And uh, um, it, uh, coming back to the middle power, and the, the middle corridor uh, uh, initiative of Turkey, uh, we have to explain that uh, this invasion in uh, Ukraine has disrupted the northern corridor for, uh, uh, for energy and trade the new Eurasian land bridge, because it, this uh, corridor passes through Russia and Belarus, which are both, these both countries are sanctioned by the West. And maybe the middle corridor will not be able, as to me, to fully replace the northern corridor, which has a lot of problems, actually, as I said, but uh, it, um, it is important that uh, uh, with Turkey, with uh, its initiative, uh, um, exploits the regional integration along the Transcaspian International Trans uh, Transport Route uh, 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 at the expense of Russia in the long term, and uses its uh, cultural aff uh, affinities with the Central Asian republics, and these countries uh, will not to, 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 to diversify themselves from Russia and China uh, in a way that provides uh, a Turkey a, greated, a, greatest, a, a greater uh, leverage uh, in this huge region in uh, Eurasia. Uh, of course, uh, Russia uh, is reacting to this uh, trying to form either the trilateral gas union with uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan so as to <clears throat> keep these important uh, uh, energy uh, producing countries close to it um, and in a win-win uh, uh, project uh, uh, trying to, to, uh, to facilitate uh, China's thirst for non-liquefied natural gas. Uh, 
uh, Russia also applies uh, its uh, Islamic uh, uh, card uh, convening the 14th Russia Islamic World International Economic Forum and in, uh, tries also in various fields to, to cooperate with the organization of Islamic cooperation. Uh, also in the Caucasus, uh, 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 it tries to, uh, to, to link the Caucasus uh, with the Middle East and uh, Africa. Uh, as, to, as to China, uh, 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 Beijing has convened the China Central Asian Economic Summit. Uh, so as to uh, tie uh, uh, Central Asian countries with its uh, 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 rail transport uh, projects, and um, uh, which of course is not for uh, is not for the interest of the West, who mainly uh, United States try to uh, um, uh, cooperate with Central Asian countries in the energy, economic and political sectors. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the whole picture uh, 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 of this uh, international uh, uh, equilibrium uh, makes that uh, uh, the Russian and uh, uh, Chinese interests collide for supremacy in Central Asia, in Middle East and Africa. And uh, uh, to, to my view, uh, there is a, a, a possibility that finally uh, Turkey will achieve to uh, combine its uh, initiative on middle corridor, of middle corridor with the BRI uh, initiative of China, uh, which are both strategic uh, projects, as uh, you understand, because uh, uh, it is a route that uh, uh, is not dominated by Russia as the Northern Corridor, and also it is a route that the United States cannot directly interdict, as with the case of the traditional maritime route. So that's from me. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. I was going to remind uh, Professor uh, Marquetos that time is up, but he reminded me that time is up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for your presentation. And um, it was, uh, as, I, as I was saying, a very interesting connection between uh, Turkey's uh, changing, trying to change its political role, geopolitical role in the Central Corridor, and of course how it might be manipulating its, uh, the, the other thing coming from the East, which is the, the uh, China, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, of course the cooperation with, with Russia, which I, I think you have, had you had more time, you would probably have more to say about that. In the end, I hope I will have the chance <laughs> to say more. <laughs> yes. So, uh, as an opening salvo, I think this was a was a very beneficial one. So, I will now invite uh, uh, Mr. Eduardo Lavezzo, who is a PhD candidate, and I wish I wish you all the best in your in your endeavors. Thank you. And uh, uh, who is going to speak about uh, Turkey's behavior? as a middle power navigating the EU-China competition. So we, we might have the other side now, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. On the, well, on the equation. First thank of all, you. thank you, the organizer of this event, for having invited me to my first official uh, presentation in the academic world. So a big appreciation to all of you. Yeah, hopefully this will be the start of a very profitable and also like enthusiastic journey in the academic and also that would might give me the chances to share my thoughts and my opinions about foreign policy behavior of the EU and on small and middle powers. Um, a premise before I start, this is just a six months research elaborate that I've done so far from January until like August. So this research might now could be like affected to possible changes in the in the future 
but at the moment what i'm giving you right now is a general understanding of what i've done so far for my phd thesis so i would like to start my research by using this picture and by giving you a brief understanding of what uh, multipolarity uh, is uh, giving us right now in the world of international relations. So, on the other hand, we have the US and the Western spheres, and by Western spheres, I mean mostly the Western allied states like Canada or Australia, Japan, South Korea, and also the EU as an organization which are facing strong resilience in exporting their ideas. Uh, and their principles in small and middle powers, in particular in those states that are facing a growing authoritarianism or a democratic backlash, as the example of Turkey would be proven. On the other hand, Russia is also facing regional constraints, as he, Mr. Putin uh, practically uh, told us last year by invading Ukraine. Everyone thought that Russia is a great power and given its wide uh, material power capabilities were able to solve the conflict in a short time, but the reality is on the, another thing. However, it still maintains strong uh, footholds in Syria, so therefore in the Middle East, and more recently in Africa, as proven by the recent coup in Niger. And finally, but not least, China resurgence as an economic power from the century of shame in the 19th century and after a strong and gradual like rebuilding process in the 20th century has been manifested through the creation and the announcement in 2013 with the of with the belt and road initiative and by the application in modern practice of their foreign policy strategy which is mercantilism which echoes with the british and french empires in the, eight, in the 18th and 19th century. Um, I've also mentioned the concept here of Jiangxia, which is uh, crucial for understanding how China portrays itself compared to small and middle powers. Jiangxia means kingdom under heaven. And according to this vision, China is going to rule the states as it was in the ancient period. Now, a quick slides about my theoretical framework. So the theory that I've been using so far for my research is based on neoclassical realism, which is a foreign policy theory that considers both systemic and regional factors, variables, and at the same time, uh, it gives importance to the unit level um, factors like ideology, governance, leadership, and leadership. As the name suggests, it combines the systemic and regional importance of neoclassical realism mm -hmm and also the impact of the human nature of the classical realism. However, this theory has a, has a strong limit, and that is, it tends to fall into the constructivist area, since it considers ideological factors, and it has not a clear scope of analysis, which might be considered as a pro, giving researchers the chances to explore the most preferable area for their analysis, but on the other hand, it tends to like fall into a vogue, vogue analysis that will bring no actual uh, uh, contributions to the scholarships. In terms of the approaches that I've been using so far uh, to describe Turkish middle powerness, I've been focusing on the behavioral and impact approach, which focuses on which kind of foreign policy and how this foreign policy manifest itself uh, towards great and uh, middle powers and also on the identity approach uh, given also the reference with neoclassical realism to explain which the national factors and cultural background uh, lies behind uh, the new like, attitude of Turkish foreign policy. So a quick like, slide about how to define uh, middle powers. As you can see from these slides, Turkey is considered as an emerging middle power. I absolutely disagree with this map for the reasons that I will show you later. Because if we consider like countries like Finland or Sweden, as I said before, as uh, emerging middle power, whereas Turkey remains an emerging middle power with insufficient data and material capabilities to understand it, 
Uh, well, that's actually unfair and for these reasons. Okay, firstly, middle powers have manifested a growing agency for seeking regional ambitions. Uh, secondly, there are also state countries that have manifested a status seeking, uh, seeking uh, um, foreign policy, which aims to increasing their role, their position in the hierarchical order, which, for example, would see, would might be Finland becoming like a middle power due to the recent entrance uh, into NATO. Thirdly, we have those states who supplies a niche diplomacy, which tends to use a strategic um, presence of resources and domestic elements just to satisfy uh, the great powers and also to attract middle powers. And finally, more recently, and which is perhaps the strategy which is, has been framed the most by the literature, is hedging, where small states dialogue so well, middle powers dialogue with great powers over security reason and this kind of strategy happens when a, um, a middle power identify a domestic or a foreign threats and therefore it intervenes directly or indirectly to solve it so these images uh, will be used to frame the ideological factors of turkey for those who are quite familiar with the editing, you can see that the images on the left is a unique photo, whereas the other one is a separate photo. And this is not uh, a case, because as you can see, we have Mustafa Kemal on the right, President Erdogan in the center. But perhaps the figure that mostly is not very known by the scholarship is that of the Sultan Abdul Ahmad II which has been recently uh, been associated with the figure of Erdogan after the failed coup of 2016. And the main reason is that both President Erdogan and the Sultan uh, Abdul Ahmad II have both faced a coup and they both managed to survive it. And therefore, the nationalistic uh, ideologies of Neo-Ottomanism of Turkey has immediately used this paradigm, this correlation, to justify what we will see later, which goes completely in contrast with Mustafa Kemal or Ataturk, which is the Turkish name for the father of Turks, had in mind in 1923, 10 years ago. So the first domestic factor that we need to consider with Turkey is its historical heritage. As the heir of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey suffers from a strong reliance of a former Ottoman grandeur, which uh, impacts on its ideological and cultural uh, background. And this goes in contrast with the secular and uh, Western vision that Ataturk had in mind a hundred years ago. The second factor is the question of the material power, because Turkey has increased its military expenditure in comparison with joint exercises with NATO, but it's also has also accepted the importation of foreign materials, mostly from Russia and from China. Although there has been also a downgrading in this kind of things due to several incidents, like the one happened in 2015 when Turkey uh, shot down a Russian jet in northern Syria, or given the recent Ukrainian and Russian war. The third factor is the pres is presidentialism, which is connected with the referendum of 2016, where Erdogan and the AKP, or as we might translate, the Justice and Development Party, have decided to completely remove the figure of the Prime Minister and give all the executive powers to the presidential figure, Erdogan, which for this reason was associated with the figure of the Sultan. Therefore, sometimes uh, Turkish presidentialism is also referred as Erdoganism due to its use of its domestic policy to enhance and to celebrate the figure of the leader as it was in the Ottoman Empire. And finally, we have the sec domestic securitization and the first thing that Turkey is trying to solve is the dilemma of the Kurds. Which in, foreign policy, which in foreign policy translates into actively crushing 
the PKK in northern Syria and Iraq, and domestically to limiting uh, the opposing parties uh, to the AKP and or yes the justice and development parties uh, but as you might know this year there were the elections and in spite of the earthquake that could have damaged Erdogan, Erdogan reputations and the power of the AKP it didn't manage to bring any changes to the Turkish domestic governance and therefore some of the scholars saw this moment as a further consolidation of Erdogan presidential power we have the identity, a new type of identity build process, which went from Europeanization in the first decades, from in the 2000s, to a new Middle Easternization in the 2010s, in the last decade, where there has been a new use of the, the ideology of neo Ottomanism to celebrate the former grandeur of the Ottoman Empire and to export the foreign policy in foreign territories. Uh, of the Ottoman Empire, which are in the Middle East and in North Africa. So, I'd say that the new type of Turkish foreign policy towards great power, towards Europe and China, is called transaction transactionalism. This is not a term that comes from my mind, but it refers to an article published by, by Bashirov and in Mats in 2020 about the new transactional uh, foreign policy behavior of Turkey towards the EU, which favors bilateral relations compared to like the vis-a-vis -vis approach that you is trying to has tried to impose turkey favors short and middle-term strategies and therefore it despises the long and bureaucratic process of the eu so therefore this element collides with the institutional uh, sphere of the eu thirdly transactionally transactionalism finds a strong pillar in identifying threats, which could be domestic and foreigners. And therefore, they tend to frame menaces, for example, like the, the Kurds in Turkey and northern Syria and Iraq, or even the presence of the Western world, which is trying to limit Turkish foreign policy as a possible menace that hampers and weaken Turkish aspiration as a regional power. So the first thing to, to remind is that Turkey is facing, uh, is struggling to face the EU normative empire. And by that, I mean that Turkey has started to dialogue with the EU in terms of migration, uh, cooperation and regards of securitization uh, of Libya and more recently of Syria due to the fail, failure strategies of the EU by using uh, non-governmental uh, organizations like Frontex to face immigration. The second factor, which is a new regional viable, is the Ukrainian and Russian war, which gives Turkey the chances to use um, the Middle Corridor Initiative and its relationship with China as a new form of an economic route that will make Turkey become like the new bridge that connects Europe and Asia and thus solidify the geopolitical and geoeconomic value of Eurasia. Then, as I said before, we have the secretization of Syria and northern Iraq. I briefly want to mention the entrance of Turkey in the second Nagorno-Karabakh war in Azerbaijan, which was the decisive moment for the Azerbaijan to win the war and to finally create, as you can see from the map, a corridor that connects Nagorno-Karabakh with Turkey and with the mainland of Azerbaijan. And by that, if you can see of the, of, from this map, these are main Turkish lands or states where there are strong presence of Turkish people. So behind it, there is also a ideological and cultural project of uniting all the Turks under a nation, uh, and that nation is Turkey. However, on the other hand, there is that there hasn't been the same enthusiasm from these smaller Turkish states like Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan. And finally, yeah, Turkey by using transactionalism wants to connect the BRI of China with its own project of the Baton Road of the Middle Corridor Initiative to further 
stabilize and strengthen the cooperation over security matters and energy co cooperation. The results of my research up to now is that Turkey represents a case of how a middle power used a transactional foreign policy behavior to navigate great power competition by preferring bilateral relations uh, and establishing uh, dark uh, dialogues with both the EU and China, um, an element that perhaps could be seen as a positive like, starting point for strengthening furthermore the Sino-Turkish relationship is the fact that the Turkish presidential turn is seen as an authoritarian um, turn by the Western scholars, where on the other hand China refers to it as a further and major uh, solidification of the Sino-Turkish relationship. Then there is a balance in original ambitions as a middle power with the pressure of great powers, or in this case from the EU and China. And thirdly, there is a use of domestic factors and ideological variables to legitimate its foreign policy. By that, I mean that Turkey is using uh, its neo-Ottoman ideology to justify the intention of recreating the formal, at least, uh, zone of influence of the Ottoman Empire. And domestically, they use the figure of Erdogan and as a linking to the former like Ottoman sultans and the figure of Abdullah II, as I showed you before, is one of the recent examples used by the Turkish scholars. Indeed, finally, there is the democratic backlash, which is seen as an authoritarian form from the EU, whereas, according to the Chinese scholar, represents a further step in solidifying their relationship. And finally, the growing presence of the state in the economy is also an element that defines how Turkey has navigate the European and Chinese interferences in its economy since as you, since after the presidential election the states became more intertwined with the economy it became like more pre pre uh, present in the banking system for example during the currency crisis in 2018-2019 the government gave the, bank the Turkish banking system the free hands to loan uh, its citizens money to survive the crisis and with that I yeah I finished my research yeah thank you to both speakers I want to take up more time from you by summarizing what has been presented after all it's a very two clear presentations here now um, can I invite questions, please, from the floor? Anyone? Uh, yes. Uh, shall we start there at the back, please? Uh, I have a question for both presenters. There is a common argument or, or made in many commentary and scholarship. Do you, and I want to just know what you think. About. Do you think that Turkey does Turkey have enough resources or potential? to fulfill this role that it wants to fill, because some claim that Turkey wants to do more than it is able and capable to do. Thank you. Good question. And, uh, yes, please. Um, needless to say that uh, I loved you both and your presentations, <laughs> but uh, I may be prejudiced for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, I think uh, both papers here and uh, yesterday mine uh, showed uh, firstly that identity matters in one way or the other, even the econ our fellow the economist uh, admitted so. Uh, and you don't and, and second thing here was proven that you don't have to be a hardcore constructivist to admit or to acknowledge that identity matters in one way or the other. Um, concerning uh, Professor Marquetos' uh, paper, uh, I have a question. First, a very brief remark. In the very beginning, for just a second, uh, it hit me back. Uh, one of your mentions hit me back. Uh, small and middle powers, and they are uh, connected in that their uh, sovereignty may be reduced. 
Well, uh, probably there are shorts of middle powers. Uh, Turkey is not a middle power to be a small, uh, closer to a small one, but it is a middle power closer to a great one, or an aspiring great one. And uh, in fact, um, uh, in the literature, and Eduardo, who is doing the, research, the PhD research, we may, uh, may have a say on this. In the literature, at least, uh, I encountered first articles, usually by Turkish scholars, dealing, tackling the expectation capabilities gap which you raised. Uh, not in terms of Turkey as a middle power. Middle power uh, is, uh, is uh, discussed in articles the last five years. But the last 10 or 12 years, Turkey is discussed as a rising power uh, or a great power. And uh, first, I have seen forums on, on Turkey as a great or rising power before seeing forums on Turkey or articles uh, as, uh, uh, as a middle power. So, uh, um, and pro probably this is uh, a way to tackle this expectations uh, capabilities uh, gap. Uh, but uh, but uh, very soon anyway, Professor Marquetos uh, went be beyond this and uh, uh, unfolded his case as uh, in terms of Turkey uh, wanting to constitute an, a pole. And, and that's an, an, an aspiration of a middle to great power, and not a middle to, to small power. Uh, so my question to you uh, uh, is, uh, in the very end, uh, you, obviously you didn't have time in the presentation to, to do so, uh, but what does the middle corridor, uh, in the way it is pursued, and it may be uh, enhanced, it may be proven to be a successful project or not, uh, but what does it mean for Turkish uh, powerhood or middle powerhood for that matter? And uh, my question to Eduardo, uh, if you have such a concrete and uh, serious thought in the very first semester of your PhD research, I uh, can't imagine uh, what you're going to do in uh, three years' time. Uh, but I would like uh, uh, just a few, uh, one glimpse to your actual, uh, your specific uh, PhD research questions. And uh, if I may put it bluntly, if you have reached the, the very crucial stage for a PhD candidate, if you know you, what you don't know in your research. Thank you very much. Yes, or uh, what okay. we don't know in the research about it as a middle part. Thank you. Um, uh, please, uh, Professor Tsardini. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to congratulate Eduard for his excellent presentation. And uh, that uh, how he uh, elaborate his topic and yeah. analyzing it. I have two brief questions for both of you. Of course, I agree with my uh, friend Kiryakos uh, who said that Turkey, according to the literature, is not pursuing its ambition to gain the status of middle power. It is a middle power. Everybody uh, 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 considers Turkey as a classic, as a, a clear example of middle power. And my question is the following for both of you. Do you consider Russia as a middle power or as an emerging again to become a superpower? Okay. Yes. And uh, one question further to uh, Eduardo. I saw one of the, in your presentation, there was a map showing Greece as an emerging middle power. Do you agree with that? Because this is uh, something that you have produced uh, for this uh, uh, paper of, on Ballas Act and the role of the middle powers. But you personally, do you agree with that? Do you prefer to hear my answer straight away um, or at the end? No, I, I think we... <laughs> I think so. Sorry, we, I didn't hear you. <laughs> but but no. then you... Hold your gun, I mean, yeah. <laughs> You have to answer other questions. Yeah, then we'll, uh, <laughs> yeah, no. 
Yes, uh, Hilary, please. Uh, thank you to, to both the presenters. Um, I don't know if mine is more a question or a comment, but uh, to Prof. Marquesos, um, something I like and then maybe a challenge. I really like your point about the complexity of identity and then the same comment that I made to you yesterday, perhaps the idea of ontological security or insecurity might be relevant to the work that you're trying to do, that body of literature. My question is, um, towards the beginning, you I think it was maybe your second slide, you talk about us moving towards this multipolar world where you say that smaller and medium powers will have less room for maneuver and will be forced increasingly to choose. But generally, in bipolar systems or so where there are fewer poles, it's more where, uh, like the, U the hegemonic um, US system was where small states had less move for ma room for maneuver because you had one pole, everything's fixed, everything's predictable, there are good things about that stability, you know what to expect, but there's less room for maneuver, whereas generally when it's more multipolar and even the cold war when you had additional poles, gave small states more room for maneuver because then they can hedge, they can play different partners off each other. I mean, when would the Solomon Islands ever be having this kind of attention from China, the US and everybody if we weren't in this more multipolar system? So I suppose it, I, my question is a challenge to your statement that a multipolar system would reduce the room for maneuver. Also, I'm not, I mean, you talk sometimes about multipolar, but then you talk about two poles, so I wasn't sure precisely. So that's my, my question to address. And then to Eduardo, uh, congratulations for your, your presentation. Thank you. I also liked how you started and you said, I hope it will be a profitable discussion because I think, I hope you mean intellectually profitable and you haven't started a PhD because you think academia is going to be <laughs> profitable. <laughs> <laughs> because quit six months in if you think that's the case. No, but it was, it was a great presentation. And I really liked your use of the maps. And I, I really liked your point about transactional foreign policy because in the beginning of your presentation, you talked quite a bit about middle power, emerging power, and I was starting to question, does, why does this definition matter? That was my first question. Does it matter if we call Turkey a middle power, an emerging power? Does it matter? But then when you talk about transactional foreign policy, I thought this is quite interesting because it's different to small states which prefer to negotiate through coalitions, multilateral institutions that have that stability, whereas you're saying specifically Turkey prefers bilateral relations. So, um, and, and also, it's, it, so it seems to have these mixes of great power in the sense of likes bilateral, but also aspects of small state because of the presence of the state in the economy, the monopoly of services. So that's more of a comment. My question would be, does the definition, what we call it, matter? Okay. Uh, any more questions, please? Ah, yeah, yes. Um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this discussion. Obviously, it's specialized a little bit on, 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 on China. It's looking forward. Um, I would I would I would not on several questions. I would uh, agree that it is middle power. Uh, there are questions of peculiarities that are very prominent right about now, particularly the control of the streets. It gets immediate direct military implications for the Russo Ukrainian wars to very clearly showcases the, the peculiarity of Turkish strategic position. Uh, and I would also argue that it attempts to 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 uh, pursue mimicry. Uh, as a great power, and this brings me back to, to my colleagues, my marriages cannot on the capabilities. Capabilities do not necessarily seem present always, but it still attempts to, 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 to be visible as a great power, at least attempting to, to, to achieve that status. Fake it till you make it, in other words. <laughs> um, uh, a question uh, more to the first presenters, but since you both both of you mentioned that, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the Belt and the Road Initiative, and this is one of the thing, things why I wanted to, to to come to Athens finally, but failed to reach Piraeus. We are feeling the, the, the backlash currently in Southern Europe, in, in Central and Eastern Europe as well, you know, Melania's statements, apparent perception, change of perception in Greece as well. On, on, on the entire situation. And so 
And it so seems, therefore, that uh, indeed we're very much aware that, that Turkey and China, they are working on those connectivity plans together. And if something tangible occurs as a result, those roads would not necessarily go to Europe. And then the question is, isn't it the case that the BRI relationship between the two countries, potential partnership like the Deepen and Kodak, would further bring Turkey southwards? towards the Middle East, towards Africa, where the actual flows of trade would eventually go if the European connection fails. So this, this is a kind of a counterfactual. Uh, I do have an answer question on the great power credentials, uh, uh, middle and great power credentials. Thinking about BRICS expansion, why Turkey was not there? Isn't it kind of fitting the profile as a NATO country? Is there any kind of debate on, on that where the Turks attempting to be the part of, of this. I'm sim simply wondering, since I'm in Greece and there are plenty it's of people. Not, it's not declared as, as far as. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's not there, so I'm kind of wondering, shouldn't it be there? I mean, Saudi Arabia is, is, is there, right? Iran is there, Turkey definitely would fit the profile, but there is the NATO membership, so probably not a thing to go further. Uh, a comment on the on the title, um, Eduardo. Again, I, I I also congratulate you. It's a very important moment uh, for you. It was very interesting uh, presentation. I'm thinking, uh, however, shouldn't be. You know, when you are talking about EU-China competition and how Turkey attempts to kind of, you know, find its own place in that. But I'm thinking about the United States here. Should, shouldn't this be a little bit more important? I mean, yeah, definitely there are normative and economic you know, instances of competition between the, the EU and China, and they, they have effects on third countries. I definitely agree with that. But the United States is the elephant in the room, ultimately. And, and you know, it's, it's, you know it, it's probably not really possible to disregard that. And um, I would like to challenge this idea that Turkey prefers bilateralism. One of the most interesting developments that we're witnessing, and you've mentioned that yourself, is the actual attempt by Turkey to, uh, to upgrade the Turkic Cooperation Council into a nascent organization, which is a very unilateral attempt, and uh, which is a telling example of the way of how middle powers and great powers behave. They attempt to create coalitions, they attempt to create groupings. So just for as food for thought. Thank you, however, it was very interesting. Right. Uh, first of all, the first question about Turkey's potential to, to, to achieve uh, its uh, goals uh, connected to the Middle Quarter Initiative. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, um, Turkey is trying ever uh, since uh, the uh, former um, Soviet Republic uh, of Central Asia and Caucasus were deconnected from Russia, is trying to uh, exert a cultural um, uh, influence uh, through its uh, through this uh, country's common cultural basis and, and linguistic basis, uh, which these uh, countries, Central Asia and Caucasus, firstly um, have uh, refused to accept thoroughly. Why? Because they were liberated from the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the uh, imposement of decisions by Russia and they want to feel this uh, freedom they have uh, achieved uh, in, a, in one way or the other and because uh, Turkey was too much excessive in its approach to these countries. So uh, is Turkey able to to uh, achieve its uh, uh, its goals? Uh, 
I'm, I'm not fully. Uh, I'm not fully uh, uh, doing this. Uh, Professor Tardanidis concerning Turkey's um, status as a middle power already, uh, and so I pose this uh, my, 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 my thought on the, on on the basis that Turkey um, that 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 uh, that doesn't have, to my view, solid. Uh, political institutions and uh, uh, does have a minority uh, a problem with the Kurds, a important minority problem. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it feels uh, surrounded by enemies and it uh, um, is uh, showing uh, broad uh, it's clearly, I, uh, I may suggest, it's uh, um, Lausanne and Serbs uh, syndrome, uh, in, in, uh, meaning that uh, it is a country that uh, every power in the world is threatening and tries to exert uh, a influence uh, that is uh, negative to its survival. So, uh, and finally, uh, the uh, the structure of the economy in Turkey does have some uh, vulnerabilities, uh, and we have seen this with uh, the current economic um, uh, uh, crisis in Turkey. Uh, Turkey, uh, Turkish people don't uh, uh, don't live in a very uh, easy way uh, nowadays. Uh, this makes me thinking uh, about the final potential of uh, Turkey. Uh, as for uh, Professor Michele's uh, uh, question, um, indeed identity matters. And uh, 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 but Turkey's identity uh, is not is not uh, to my view not so clearly uh, um, um, defined. Uh, um, in every single small or bigger town in Turkey, we can see a big, huge. La Turkish flag over a building, over a park, over a, in every hill, showing what? That we, you all, you are Turkish people, which is not a real thing. Because there are, uh, besides the Turks, there are Alevites in, in Turkey who still suffer from discrimination. It, it is a country that is uh, profoundly, uh, as you can find in the literature, uh, um, between uh, uh, Anatolian people who have uh, been privileged by the AKP and Erdogan policy in uh, recent years, and the other parts in Istanbul and in minor uh, uh, Asia who have uh, uh, a vision to become, to, to, be, uh, to be in future be part of uh, Europe. So it's not, it's not a country that have uh, uh, that uh, solid characteristics that could Bring us, uh, brings us to to believe it, to already have uh, achieved the middle power status. Uh, identity matters. Uh, 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 Turkey uh, is possible to become a great power. I, I don't know. I, I I really don't know. I just don't know. Uh, 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 what does a middle quarter mean uh, for a middle power? Uh, in, in the case that um, 
indicates that Turkey can achieve its goal to, to make middle corridor a reality, and it works for this uh, reason with uh, Central Asian and uh, um, Caucasus countries um, 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 in various fields of infrastructure, mainly in rail uh, roads and uh, so on. Uh, maybe, uh, because uh, there is an identity and a cultural background. But will it be uh, uh, given this opportunity by the US uh, and China to be a, a pole between the two and, 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 and play with both? I don't know. Because uh, as for now, uh, China is not, uh, uh, is not, has not shown so willing itself uh, uh, to accommodate Turkey uh, towards its uh, vision regarding the middle culture. As for, as for now, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, um, concerning uh, um, Hillary's uh, question, uh, uh, multipolarity. Uh, uh, um, I believe, uh, as uh, Professor Lavdas has uh, explicitly uh, written, uh, that we are living in a multipolar and a multicentric world. In the uh, uh, why say that because uh, Turkey is to, uh, to my view at the center. Maybe uh, it, it's it's uh, struggling to become a, a pole, but uh, I believe it's just for now a, pole, a center, and it points to 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 be uh, more than a, a center. And uh, for this uh, goal, it uh, cooperates with Italy, for example, uh, uh, through uh, uh, um, its um, strategy to, uh, to uh, connect uh, with Italy uh, in a trans-Mediterranean uh, trade and energy corridor towards um, uh, uh, Western and uh, Western Africa. So, uh, in, in Turkey, in Italy is um, working uh, in a very low profile way uh, in this regard with Turkey. And so, uh, through the, uh, the Matei, Matei plan regarding the energy. <laughs> Uh, finally, as to uh, uh, Turkish-China cooperation, uh, in, indeed, uh, because we are living in a, in a, a, a market economy, who pro, who uh, uh, who provides more? Uh, it gets most. <laughs> so, uh, at this moment, we're uh, in, in Europe, we're facing an LNG uh, transition uh, problem. Because, why? Because many countries in uh, Asia want the uh, LNG produced uh, by, the, uh, by the Gulf states and uh, they get it because they uh, they give more and uh, europe uh, is maybe is facing another winter with um, possible shortages in, in its uh, uh, energy security uh, uh, problem uh, and uh, i don't really believe that turkey is going to apply for BRICS as for now, uh, because uh, uh, it concedes uh, 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 BRICS as very bug 
uh, vague. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it uh, prefers something more concrete. Mm. Interesting. Between the answer about Russia, if it is middle power or not. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, during the war or after the war? No, even during and after, and uh, before that. Be be before the end? Be before the Ukrainian war, even before 2012. Uh, yes. Yeah. Before uh, invading Crimea. Not even before Russia. Before uh, uh, Russia, as, as you know, Professor, uh, has the economy of uh, Spain, of the possibility of the, the Spanish economy. So uh, um, uh, it's definitely not a great power anymore, except for a, a, a military potential. But uh, in the economic sphere, it's very weak. And I am afraid that under uh, the uh, circumstances of this uh, ill-conceived uh, decision of uh, Putin to launch uh, this uh, yeah. aggressive uh, uh, assault in, in Ukraine, uh, it, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, uh, Russia is going to be uh, in, uh, um, insulated from uh, uh, all the West for many decades, and uh, because of this, will not have the potential uh, uh, to become a, a greater power because it will not have the uh, possibility to, to interact with technological uh, 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 technology producing uh, powers right um, uh, but how would that play out i'm not an expert in this area so uh, please excuse me if i how would it play out if uh, Russia turns east, cooperating with uh, uh, China, most particularly. Uh, what it loses in the West, it can make up in the East, doesn't it? Uh, uh, it cooperates closely with China, but as what? As uh, a minor play. And after the uh, under uh, current conditions of, of the Ukraine uh, yeah I mean war. In, te in technology for example if they start uh, you know they could be a challenge to the West as well uh, in, in which field uh, several fields I mean the potential of China now which is you know on the on many fronts and uh, combined with Russia. But what is China's remains China's, I believe. It's not, be, it's, not be, it's not going to be shared with Russia. Because a, uh, even though they, uh, these uh, powers do cooperate closely, uh, they uh, are actual and geopolitical competitors. Mm. So uh, China's uh, technological might is not, to my view, going to be shared with Russia. Russia, uh, uh, I believe, will uh, continue to remain an energy uh, tank for China, a, but as a, um, not as a subordinate country, but as a, a, a as a minor importance uh, country in the Russia China tandem. Okay. Until China gobbles it up. Until? Until China gobbles it up eventually. Yes. Yes, Eduardo. I'm sorry, I no, I don't know. Um, okay, so regarding the first question of Professor Antonovich, um, I do think that 
yes, that Turkey has the potential to become a regional power by uh, using the middle corridor as the main secondary route of the Belt and Road Initiative to enrich the country's economy and geopolitical and geoeconomic role in the region. However, um, as I forgot to mention during my presentation, due for time limits, there are social and economic limits that hampers this desire, this Turkish desire. Um, first of all, um, and this one I didn't mention in my presentation, there is a problem regarding how China and Turkey intends securitization in the Belt and Road Initiative. And by that, I mean that where, while Turkey prefers to direct its in directions and efforts towards the Kurds, China is facing a strong uh, social and cultural problem in dealing with the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang. And as we know, the Uyghurs uh, are, belong to the Turks people. And therefore, this represents a limit for both China and Turkey to fully fulfill a complete uh, military and also uh, security cooperation in the region. Uh, in practice, economically, there is also the problem due to the trade deficit between Turkey and China, due to the fact that mainly China has been using uh, Turkish industries and goods, for example, marbles and textile industries and chemicals products, whereas Turkey imports mainly from the primary sectors from China and also and on a lower scale from its military uh, sphere. However, I do feel that if Turkey managed to balance its relationship with China and at the same time to remain a stable and a trusty neighbor of the EU, then I would think that Turkey would man be managed to fully uh, advance his status as a middle power to become a regional power, which tends to use more soft, which tends to use more soft power than hard power to maintain its regional influence in the MENA region. Uh, in regards of the question of Professor Kiriakos, well, well, after eight months of PhD, I can say that yes, new, uh, for me, neoclassical realism is the best uh, theory to use when investigating middle and small states, because it's impossible to understand how states behave without knowing what kind of the identity the states have of themselves and how this identity is projected to foreign states. But in regards to the main question, if I manage to understand and to acknowledge the limits of my analysis and if there are some arguments that have not been analyzed enough by the literature, well, at the moment, I think that perhaps the most important lack in the scholarship regards the use of a constructivist approach that compares how Turkey identity collides or not with the Chinese identity. Um, because from my experience as an historian, um, I would say that Turkey and Turkish people throughout their history have always been a sense of inferiority towards greater cultures. For example, when they moved from Central Asia to Persia and then to Asia Minor, they adopted the Persian costumes and the sultans refer to them as Shah. When they conquer Constantinople, which, if I say this term in Istanbul right now, is bad, badly viewed due to the Greek origins of the name, then they adopted the term Kaiser, and so they immediately saw themselves as the true heir of the, of the Roman Empire. Now, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, they are trying to revive their identity, but now using coercive methods, like Russia is doing right now in Ukraine, but by using public diplomacy, soft power, uh, and mainly using their geographical and 
geoeconomic uh, value to attract interest of foreign uh, uh, actors like the EU and China on the other hand. So yeah, the answer to your question is probably that there is a gap, a constructivist gap in the Turkish and Chinese identity and culture. In regards of the two questions of Professor uh, Tsardinidis, uh, if Russia is a middle power or an emerging uh, superpower, I would say that if I'm going to do a complete analysis since the collapse of the USSR until nowadays, I would say that if we are looking to the Russian economy, we are talking about a middle power. If you are looking at the Russian military sphere, we are looking to a great power or to a superpower. And the reason is that they have a nuclear arsenal. But if you are looking also at the how they use their foreign policy to influence or to force minor states to enter into the Russian dominion and recreate what it was, not the Soviet Union, but the Tsardom of Russia, which goes back in, in at uh, 1917, then I would say that it's a great power. It is, it is a great power. Good. So, if we, so if I have to use like a mathematic approach, uh, we have a, mid, a middle power economy, a super power military, and a great power uh, use of foreign policy. We say that Russia is just a great power. In regards to the second question, if Greece is a middle power, um, again, if you consider the cultural impact that Greece has over the Eastern Mediterranean and had in the history, I would say that is a superpower or a great power. But nowadays, if you are just focusing on the regional sphere of the Eastern Mediterranean, I would say that Greece, yes, is a middle power. But it's, it's, it suffers from a uh, uh, weak eco economy and domestic governance. But it has the potential to at least remain a, mi a middle power. So Turkey is an emerging uh, middle power and Greece is a middle power. Um, there is something there which does not tick. I, I, I would, uh, I'm not able to accept that. There is something which doesn't taste well. Yes. Well, um, another case. Yeah, that's that's another case. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, please. Uh, respectfully, because you mentioned about neoclassical uh, realism and identity, uh, it's an excellent tool. You could also uh, research other intervening domestic variables. There are two excellent books. Maybe you have encountered during your research about Alaphero, Ripsman, and Lobel. Uh, they have written about neoclassical realism, state and foreign policy, and actually this was my argument that I wasn't allowed, unfortunately, to make yesterday about when I would start seeing their methodological yes. problems. Uh, because with small states, if you don't examine the domestic, these very like leadership, like mm -hmm. domestic uh, bureaucracies, which is something that you definitely encounter with your research with uh, uh, Turkey, and plays a big role in, in its identity, how to project itself as a center or as a middle power. Um, uh, you know, uh, this will be an excellent tool to examine, like use Talaferro's model to examine all other intervening variables where he connects the domestic structure with international in order to create foreign policy. So I just wanted respectfully to give you this uh, advice since you are using this tool. And thank you very much for this great uh, presentation. To be fair, I read the the book of Rizman Lobel, and I've read also further uh, materials of uh, Nicholas Taliaferro. Yeah, and also yeah. Sweller and Gidon Rose, yeah. where they say that there is not one neoclassical realism. Right now it's in flux. We have several. They're trying to find, actually, the theory. And that's why it becomes an excellent tool also for shelter theory, like to, to reconcile some elements of shelter theory. But thank you so much for your presentation. Oh. Thank you, because you are giving me like uh, valid feedbacks for my research. And to be honest, I mentioned it with my supervisor, but at the moment they just want me to focus more on how I, I need to justify the use of uh, 
neoclassicalism and focusing on identity and nationalism in my research. Mm -hmm. So that will be for further research and for the literature review for this year. However, thank you very much for the feedback. Okay. Um, yeah, in regards of your questions, Hilary, about transactionalism and the definition of this foreign policy behavior. I'm not sure I really asked a question. I just thought yeah. that was a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Well, the, the thing is that this is not like a, a definition that I've coined, but it's a term that I stand for, because yes. it better describes how a middle power adopts a completely different foreign policy strategy, which is not hedging. Yes. Although Turkey has manifested a hedging and niche diplomacy with the EU in the last, in, in the, at the beginning of this new millennium, due to its EU membership status, which uh, failed in 2011 due to the Arctic Springs. However, yeah, I do think that referring to Turkish foreign, pol Turkish foreign policy behavior as a transactional attitude, that would be like the best definition for my research. I think it's good because it shows a difference between what small states do, like this emphasis on Turkey doing things bilaterally is just quite different to the support that small states seek to do things through formal rules and frameworks and institutions that level out that power asymmetry, whereas Turkey doesn't have to worry about that to the same extent. So I, I think that given your framing it all around middle powers, it helps to solidify what makes a middle power different to a small state. So I thought that was very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I still have one question. Oh, one question. Yeah. Regarding to the final question, Professor and Yuskas, I'm in pronouncing your surname correctly. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have apologies in advance. So, okay, so why not the US? Well, to be honest, I focus on the EU and China just because I want to do something original with my research. Because most of the literature would immediately compare the US and China c competition being like the two currently major power superpowers in geopolitics. But for historical and geographical region, I think that a European and Chinese comparison with in Turkey is the best example. So due mainly to my intention to use neoclassical realism and identity to frame neo-Ottomanism. And since the Ottoman Empire was str strongly present in Europe, especially in the Balkans, Focusing on the EU rather than on the US, uh, up to me and for the purpose of my research, uh, that would be like the best choice to like produce a neoclassical and realist uh, research about Turkish foreign policy. Sorry to interrupt. I do believe that this argument in itself is very interesting, and that you could elaborate on that way more. That the the EU Turkish competition should be talked about and approached in this way that the children are attempting to do. It's very interesting. And again, unusual. It's just good stuff. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Um, well, I do, at the moment, I'm thinking that I still need to further develop my defense about why using a classical realism to define e the European and the Chinese competition in Turkey. But since I'm going to stress the importance of the ideological factors and domestic factors regarding governance and nationalism and how this is seen by the EU as a potential menace, if Turkey will be in the future a future EU, EU member, or how Turkey will impact on the EU uh, economy, well, yeah, I do think that using neoclassical realism as the main foreign policy theory for my research is the best option. And in, also in regards of Turkey not using uh, bilateral relations, I do agree with you that Turkey has manifested the intention to establish bilateral relations with the EU before the Arab Springs uh, and the failed coup of 2016 due to the EU membership status. But since after the Arab Springs and the failed EU membership process, uh, Turkey has evolved its foreign policy. And after 
I've read the article of Bashirov and Mats about the location transactional foreign policy towards the EU. I have chosen to agree with their opinion about Turkey being a transactionalist uh, geopolitical actor. Right. Um, uh, Just a small comment, you know, the question if I'm allowed. Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to comment to this transactionalism and this uh, building Turkey a stronger identity through historical, cultural, and ideological uh, factors. Uh, three years ago, July 22, we've seen the transformation with the uh, Turkish government sent from the Jerry, Turkish Jerry, of the big, one of the biggest cultural, universal cultural monuments, Hagia Sophia, turned into Muslim, and also which was not under the permission of the UNESCO, and without even uh, sending any, having any negotiations or even relations with this. Just a small comment how this uh, transmission from Europeanization to Ottoman is through building, reinforcing this identity uh, has made this power to build all these uh, new forms of foreign policy especially through culture or that the plus in terms. Just please thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you thank you all for your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank the speakers, uh, Professor Marquetos and uh, uh, Lorenzo here. He has a very promising project, I must say. And um, I thank all the uh, participants for your contribution because you enriched the, the discussion here. Thank you very much. I think we stop here because we are going to miss our coffee. Um, Ms. Corina Asteriu, she is a PhD candidate at the Department of International and European Studies at the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki, and the title of her presentation is Small States and the EU Policy Making Process, the case of the 2015 refugee crisis. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Karina and I'm going to approach the issue of the 2014 refugee crisis, uh, that means the Syrian crisis, uh, from the aspect of uh, policy making and its effects on uh, small European states. In particular, we're going to analyze the EU strategy um, about the refugee crisis, the implementation of the uh, EU policies for social inclusion, the action plan on protecting vulnerable persons uh, in the context uh, of migration and asylum in Europe, uh, the, uh, the security of uh, issue of uh, small EU member states, uh, the EU position uh, on, uh, on that matter, the differences between the refugee crisis of 2014 and 2022, uh, the refugee status and the right to work, the issue of illegal migrants, uh, the case of vulnerable social groups, uh, the reception of uh, the refugees by the local communities, the implications on the economy, and last but not least, we will see an interstate comparison. In the EU, refugees have numerous rights, including uh, some social ones. Uh, refugee integration uh, is equivalent to respectful employment, economic and social equality, dignity and moral acceptance. The basic step towards integration is the full access to social services, such as the educational system, the judicial system and health units. But the most important step, so that prosperity and unity arrive, constitutes the right to work, and therefore the employment possibility. This particular right falls into many categories. Asylum seekers that complete uh, the procedure of applying for international protection and possess a valid uh, applicant for international protection card uh, or asylum uh, seekers card have the right to enroll in salaried employment or in the provision of services of work. But they don't have the right to be self-employed or start their own enterprises. 
free uh, registered uh, asylum seekers can claim the right to access uh, legal employment until the procedure of full lodging the asylum application gets completed. Moreover, the asylum seeker's card must be valid for legal employment. When it comes to the 1951 convention relating to the status of uh, refugees, those rights aren't guaranteed per se by the articles, but they are created to promote the meaning of its rights and dedicate uh, to the refugees some articles that are similar to those uh, for the legal migrants. And grammatically, the Article 17 is about wage earning employment, the Article 18 is about self-employment, and the Article 19 is about uh, liberal professions. Now, we could say that the uh, 2018 Global Compact uh, on Refugees is uh, the 21st uh, century's uh, convention about the refugees. Uh, the Articles 70 and 71 are all about jobs in livelihoods. Most countries' national laws and policies must contribute resources and expertise to promote economic opportunities, decent work, job creation, and uh, other programs for refugees, mostly uh, to start their own businesses. The resources must be used to support labor markets, to analyze uh, job opportunities, to map and to recognize the skills and the qualifications of refugees, and to support the access to affordable financial products and services. And the great lagoon in the refugee employment uh, situation constitute, constitutes the illegality of their status. Illegal migrants don't have the right to work. Most of them get frequently involved in illegal trade, for labor, traffic, and, and manual labor, mostly at the agricultural domain. Violent incidents in the workplace often occur. Uh, the overcrowding conditions in hotspot, co hotspot, hotspots sorry, combined with the enormous amount of people arriving either from the sea or from the mainland led to the delay of the process of uh, identification and, uh, and asylum application. This outrageous delay, combined with the delay in the interviews for the status of refugee, provoked the outburst of uh, illegal migrants, who then attempt to get occupied illegally. That leads to serious perceptible effects on tax revenues, on employment and on overall economy. Uh, the EU initiated the policy of asylum application in the entry state, instead of the state that the, that the potential refugees are relocated or even detained, making the process impossible to get accomplished by the authorities since the, ma the majority of entry states uh, are small and insufficient in administration and resources, both human and financial. That particular EU policy led to the enlargement of the number of illegal migrants. Uh, in 2015, uh, we have the establishment of the European Agenda on Migration that consists of policies relate, uh, related to uh, immediate actions, long-term actions, measures for the civil society, and most of all, uh, measures for social and labour market integration. In terms of, of budgetary measures, 1.7 billion euros got spent from 2015 till 2016 for the addressing of the refugee crisis, 3.1 billion euros from 2014 until uh, 2020 and 9.9 billion euros with the, uh, with the Ukrainian refugee crisis being included. Uh, the social inclusion uh, of the refugees could be a way to reverse a grand demographic issue such as the aging population, uh, the 0.2% uh, growth per annum, uh, which is crucially below the replacement uh, capacity and an estimated loss of 30 million people of working age by, the, uh, by two, uh, 2015. 2050, uh, 2000, and its socio-economic effect. Uh, the EU plan supports migrants to public services. Social integration, though, is highly connected to market integration. Impact uh, of migrants, uh, the impact, uh, its impact of migrants uh, in, uh, occur, occurs uh, at uh, the level of wages, on the availability of, uh, of jobs, on the pressure on the fiscal system, and on the effects of multiculturalism. Uh, integration on the labour market is based on the level of unemployment in the host countries, on the migrant skills and, in, uh, and their level, on the learning of the language of the host country before their entry to the EU territory, uh, on the formal training that they have received in the host country, on the existing organisations, uh, on the available structures, on the willingness and openness of the civil society, on the quick recognition of their qualifications, of the bureaucratic obstacles and the lack of transparency, on existing xenophobia and misperception about uh, migrants, on their exploitation, on outdated laws, 
uh, on the non-implementation or slow uh, trans, um, transposition of the EU legislation, on the role of trade unions and employers association, associations, and lastly, um, governments, local and regional authorities and social partners. The main core uh, could be uh, about the European agenda uh, on migration. Uh, we could say that the main core could be referred as a relocation method of asylum seekers based on emergency criteria among the EU countries for the uh, diminution of the extenuation of the states, which host an excessive amount of asylum seekers. Uh, we have the introduction of a relocation mechanism for 20,000 refugees from outside the EU and the financial enlargement of its budget by 50 million euros uh, in uh, between between uh, 2015 and 2016. Uh, then we have also the front for enforcement, the increase of uh, border control and surveillance uh, operations uh, frequencies uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, the extension of the emergency funds for the EU member states which stood on the front line of the crisis by 60 million euros, the introduction of hotspots, the famous hotspots, uh, the cooperation of uh, Frontex, Eurobol, and the European Asylum Support Office that happened regularly in Greece, uh, and the establishment of uh, the common security and defense policy operation in the Mediterranean in order to destroy the traffickers' networks, the smugglers' tra tactics, and their vessels. We move on uh, to uh, um, the European Eco Economic and Social Committee, uh, which believes that uh, national uh, policies on migrant labor are not sufficient enough and there is high need for European directives. Um, employment constitutes a precondition for integration and social co cohesion. cohesion. Uh, so, uh, migrants uh, may have a positive uh, outcome, uh, migration uh, might, have, uh, might uh, have a positive uh, outcome in economic development and well-being in Europe, uh, and also migrants uh, can contribute uh, to demographic, demographics, but uh, uh, and also in um, uh, efficient governance uh, and legislation that uh, are highly demanded in order to achieve this effect. Uh, the European Economic and Social Committee pushes the Council uh, to adopt a directive guaranteeing a common framework of rights for uh, immigrant workers and to enhance uh, existing anti-discrimination legislation. That means equal opportunities and equal treatment uh, are key points and uh, causes for social dialogue. Diversity in the workplace must become a goal. Lastly, the creation of a European platform for social dialogue on labour migration is wanted. Uh, the political landscape uh, played a crucial role um, in the policy making process as the states uh, who traveled politically with authoritarian governments such as Hungary, Italy and uh, Austria decided to close their, their national borders and not accept any refugee. As a result, the other states got uh, severely charged with, more, uh, charged with more responsibilities. That changed the policy making process, of course, and most of all it provoked xenophobia in the local societies. Um, Europe's decision to proceed on directives and the recommendations is, instead of regulations and decisions complicated the already stiff situation. The non-existence of a common regulation when it comes to the treatment of the crisis led to the creation uh, of two degree states uh, because um, uh, the states that were in the front line uh, on the front line uh, got suffocated by the sudden refugee flow in comparison to the states which were mainly or partially uh, uh, affected. Uh, the lack of responsibilities uh, division from the first time was critical. The directives uh, for the crisis were sometimes ineffective as they did not correspond to the special needs uh, each uh, state had. Uh, also, the number of refugees uh, it hosted and its financial capabilities uh, played a crucial uh, role. NGOs contributed significantly, uh, significantly to the dealing of the crisis uh, by all aspects. Uh, human rights, respect, education of the minors, treatment of the unaccompanied children, medical supplies and nutrition. The adoption, the adoption of the policy of refuelment and relocation to stop the suffocation of the small member states which faced the grand wave of refugees faced a delay. Meanwhile, the situation in many hotspot, hotspots was dehumanized. Now about the Council of Europe, uh, Europe's action plan on protecting vulnerable persons in the context of, uh, context of migration and asylum in Europe, uh, we would like to focus on the third pillar, which is all about fostering democratic participation and enhancing inclusion. 
Uh, it could be characterized as a theoretical effort uh, by the Council of Europe for the social inclusion of refugees and the degrees of discrimination and xenophobia. Uh, we have uh, the establishment of the European qualification passports for refugees for the easy recognition of degrees and qualifications. Uh, about the implementation of the action plan, the adoption of a model framework for an intercultural integration strategy for the national level by the steering committee of anti discrimination, diversity, and inclusion took place in June 20, 20, uh, 2021, uh, 2021 uh, with the adoption of a recommendation of uh, multi level policies and governance uh, for intercultural uh, integration. Um, we move on. Uh, moving on to the part of uh, small EU states, we could agree that they are challenging the economies and the added refugee crisis constitutes an additional challenge. Now the need for adaptation is even higher. The Syrian refugee crisis was generally characterized as a crisis mostly for small states. The financial crisis occurred at the same time with the refugee one. The outcomes were the renationalization of European politics and the return of geopolitics and disagreements among European powerful states. Uh, policies are mainly designed uh, by the most uh, powerful European state. Uh, and that was uh, a decision between harmonizing with the established EU policies uh, and showing autonomy by proceeding to unilateral moves in order to deal with migrant flows at the national borders, borders was needed. There are external and domestic strategies such as shelter, hiding, hedging, and normal um, uh, business activities. Um, securitization of migration and fantasy to victim, uh, victimization and blaming the EU and other states for the size and the extent of the crisis while trying to adapt administratively. Uh, in, in, uh, I mean, in the administ um, administrative domain, uh, domain uh, to the challenges in order to cope up. Moreover, small states uh, do not possess an extremely developed and grand administrative uh, sector and governance effectiveness. So they are limited. They have limited means to deal with the massive crisis. Uh, the constraint resources and the absence of uh, economies of scale in the Balkans uh, do not help at all. Uh, the issue uh, of borders and the Schengen Agreement is an uh, old EU story, but somehow it remains on the surface. Schengen Agreement's initial role is a unification of the EU states, the, dis the disappearance of internal borders, so that trade and human movement can be free. In reality, objections started to appear, and the refugee crisis constitutes a glorious example. Although all EU states are allies and unified on many levels, the Dublin Agreement declares that asylum seekers must apply for asylum in their entry country, although the frontline states had been already suffocated by the massive flows and were incapable of dealing, uh, on dealing with that situation. The frontline states were mostly the small ones, such as Greece, Croatia, Cyprus, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Malta and Greek, plus Spain and Italy. Uh, with the EU deciding that those small states are the designated ones uh, for the safety uh, of the EU borders, caused several troubles, both financial and administrative. Uh, so we have two completely different notions, the EU for the unification and the tactic of exhausting uh, the small states by adding to their uh, agendas more responsibility. Uh, we also have a security issue, such as the entrance of possible terrorists. Uh, the, unfortunately, the refugee crisis led to the de-Europeanization of small states and to the polarization of society with security implications. It was a cause for identity crisis and there is a high need for stronger attachment between integration policy and border and, uh, immigration control. Indirect uh, immigration control may lead to disorientation from the initial and basic goals of in, uh, integration policies. Uh, the EU the EU policy is focused on defense, uh, border protection and refuelments. Uh, small states uh, solder the heavy burden. Burden uh, With the EU not constituting a unifying actor in the whole that acts as one state, its member uh, state developed its own crisis management mechanism. A uh, strong political and interdisciplinary dispute occurred among the EU states uh, and have their origins in the Schengen Agreement era. As long as it concerns um, the vulnerable social groups, unaccompanied minors, women and smugglers uh, victims or human trafficking victims are situated on the top of the list and they are the, uh, the people who face the, uh, the most serious um, um, problems on uh, integrating and uh, progress uh, financially and socially.
Uh, there is also a very particular issue, uh, and that's the differences uh, between the refugee crisis, the treatment of the refugee crisis of 2014, and the treatment of the refugee crisis of 2022, that we have refugees of two classes. Uh, for example, the Ukrainian uh, refugees um, got uh, very easily and rapidly uh, helped by the uh, European Union, although uh, I'm sorry. On the other hand, the Syrian crisis did not have did not have the same acceptance by the EU. Uh, we have an interesting comparison. We see that uh, the Balkan states were uh, the most affected. Uh, Germany also absorbed a large number of refugees. Uh, and about the impact on the economy. I, according to the service of the Organization uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development, we have a positive correlation between migration. Um, and economic uh, growth. Um, uh, unemployment, does, um, that means that uh, migration uh, can offer um, many, uh, can offer prosperity to the uh, European Union uh, because it helps the demographics, demographics that are declining and the growth uh, rate. Uh, as an overall review, we could say that the refugee crisis is not just a humanitarian crisis, but it is also a financial and a deep political one. It raised particular issues, particular issues, mostly foreign policy related, as well as uh, convert, uh, um, opposite uh, interests and uh, that coexisted in the EU since decades, but remained unsolved. Inequalities uh, within the EU became obvious, and the Europeanization climate and xenophobia flourished among Europe. Identity crisis occurred, and the EU enlargement project took some steps back. Unresolved issues of the past, such as the Schengen Agreement, appeared to, into the surface again. Uh, on the surface again. Uh, the EU saw the delayed reaction that led to the suffocation of small states. Uh, small states constitute uh, the main entry state millions of refugees, with the EU deciding that the asylum application process must take place in the entry countries. Um, they came to a stand, uh, standstill uh, as the bureaucratic, administrative and financial levels uh, are not equivalent to such demands. Uh, we have also the refugees of the two classes, as mentioned before, Syrians and Ukrainians. Uh, the social and economic integrations got, uh, integration got added, got added as primary goals uh, in the European agenda the latest years. Uh, the main focus of, the, uh, of this integration scene constitutes the, the educational and cultural domain as, um, uh, as some uh, uh, prerequisites, I can pronounce it very well, this word, uh, for work related and economic inclusion and prosperity. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Corina. Thank you for the extra time. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, so we are moving on to Mr. Georgios Papadimitriou. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at the Department of International and European Studies at the University of uh, Macedonia in Thessaloniki. And uh, the title of his presentation is At the Crossroads of Realism and Idealism, the stage of the Scandinavian Peninsula and the inevitable end of a journey on two boats. Okay, I want to apologize up to you because it's gonna be it's gonna be a good twenty minutes, if not uh, twenty one. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for um, accepting this work to be included in the uh, in this uh, in this workshop. Uh, before I begin, uh, some theoretical clarifications. I use the term Nordic to refer exclusively to Finland, Sweden, and uh, Norway. Uh, the term Grand Strategy refers to the process that addresses the question what the larger aims, what the state larger aims are in the world, and how best they can be secured in a rational manner. I use the term prosperity, domestic prosperity, individual prosperity and their variants uh, to refer to mass public prosperity and not to the economic power of the state. Uh, in general, prosperity since ancient times refers to the capacity of individuals to live and feel uh, well within the safe uh, boundaries of a state. So therefore, it's not another term for, for wealth. It's much more than that. In numerically estimating uh, domestic prosperity, uh, I've used the Legaton Institute Prosperity Index, uh, which is a state-of-the-art uh, tool, specifically designed, not by me, uh, for, for the purpose. Uh, 
consisting of more than 60 uh, prosperity-related uh, sub-indices. Uh, in estimating military capacity, I've used annual military spending values. Uh, however, uh, reference to standing forces uh, figures is made uh, when uh, necessary. Now, to the main course. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine literally shattered the notion that violence in the European Union, uh, in the European continent, uh, has dissipated long ago. Following the invasion, uh, the Nordic states resorted to intense effort to increase their hard power capabilities, a stance that signaled severe military shortcomings, uh, and, of course, inspired the, uh, the investigation of their grand strategies, so as to examine the way these actors perceived uh, the international environment. Uh, the article aims to demonstrate first that the Nordic states adopted the uh, almost identical, whereas the, the term identical is too strong, uh, similar, let's say, in principle, grand strategies, uh, with a traditional realistic foundation, but idealistic as far as foreign policy, and most importantly, uh, defense are concerned, uh, relying heavily on, uh, substantially, on uh, collective uh, military collaborations. Secondly, uh, with a powerful revisionist actor on the backyard, and with collective defense being a matter that takes time and effort to become effective, uh, it is argued that these actors need more realistic approaches, with emphasis on improving uh, the military capabilities by internal balancing uh, actions. Well, that was there now. Uh, in doing so, uh, the Nordic grand strategies are first reviewed through primary resources, and in this manner the idealism is uh, mostly demonstrated. I then open a theoretical parenthesis to illustrate that the core objective is related to traditional realistic thought. I think that that's really interesting. And lastly, an empirical approach is suggested to demonstrate that there is enough room to invest more in, uh, in hard power. I will skip that and that and that. Okay, now going straight to the strategies. And in an attempt to avoid repetitions, it is underlined that the facilitation of domestic prosperity, the prosperity of their societies, has been the grand objective throughout the observation period uh, since the late 2000s, I say again, uh, for all three Nordic states. Uh, similar have been the domestic implementation policies, uh, which follow the Nordic welfare model, according to which prosperity is facilitated by providing incentives to work, uh, maintaining high wages and, uh, and taxes, investing uh, greatly on welfare and support services, and maintaining a large yet effective public sector. Changes are detectable in foreign policy and defense as a result of Russian revisions predominantly, uh, materialized in 2014 with the annexation of uh, Crimea and uh, 2022 with uh, the full invasion in, in Ukraine. And this is where we focus on the next few uh, slides. Now, uh, briefly, let's have a look at the strategies beginning with Finland, uh, the, the principles of the strategy. Right? Uh, before the annexation of Crimea, the country identified no imminent threats uh, in the strategic environment. Uh, hence, close economic ties uh, with Russia were pursued a move that also harbored the idealistic idea of bringing Russia closer uh, to the EU values. Finland's doctrines at the time embraced idealistic objectives, seeking, for example, to make the country the vehicle to promote democracy. Most importantly, uh, idealism prevailed in the state's defense deliberations, since not only Finnish administrations adopted an external balancing biased stance, relying heavily on military collaborations with the EU and other Nordic actors, uh, but at the same time, they maintained an active force of 25,000 people, supported by a military spending that did not exceed 3.5 billion, which is the lowest among, as, as you can see in Figure 1, uh, among Nordic states, and only higher than those of uh, Estonia, Latvia, and uh, Lithuania, as far as uh, the Greater Baltic Sea region. Following the annexation of Crimea, the administration uh, openly admitted serious military uh, deficiencies and increased its military spending to just over 5 billion in 2021. Uh, nevertheless, it did not get rid of the affirmation idealistic uh, discourses. The invasion of Ukraine brought more realism into Finland's grand strategy. Uh, its military spending was increased by a staggering 36%. Uh, simultaneously, a probably desperate uh, quest to increase active military personnel began since uh, uh, retired officers were given the, the chance to uh, return back to active service. And not surprisingly, uh, the military uh, non-alignment stance was uh, abandoned and the state became a NATO member in 2023, uh, as you all know. Overall, Finland 
successfully facilitated prosperity levels, as you can see in figure two with the red line. However, in terms of uh, developing endogenous hard power uh, capabilities, it remains to be to this day superior only uh, to Latvia, Estonia, and uh, Lithuania in the Baltic uh, Sea region. Uh, a similar pattern was followed by uh, Sweden. Prior to, to the Crimea events, Sweden also identified no imminent regional threats and embraced the idealistic objectives, pursuing, for example, a dialogue with China uh, to address civil and political rights uh, issues. In terms of national defense, uh, Sweden relied substantially on uh, pretty much the same external collaboration mechanism as, uh, as Finland. Uh, indicative of Sweden's defense idealism is the fact that conscription was terminated in uh, 2010, and by 2013 the country maintained an active force of only 16,000 people, 16, people, supported by a military spending of around 5 billion, and so in figure 3 with the red line, which is very, very visible. I don't think if you can see that red line. Anyway. Um, the annexation of Crimea found Sweden with a downsized army and an intense feeling of insecurity. Hence, the administration attempted to reinforce the state's uh, military capabilities, uh, such as, for by example, by uh, moves such as uh, reinstating conscription in 2017 and gradually increasing its uh, military spending to 7.3 billion. However, at the same time, the government weakened its navy by decommissioning several uh, vessels and continued to articulate idealistic narratives. After the invasion of uh, Ukraine, and given the endogenous defense capability, NATO membership became a priority, military spending values increased further, and the government established the first ever uh, National Security Council in 2022, that was. Uh, still though, it would be inaccurate to conclude that Sweden departed from idealism, given that it continues to maintain an active force of only 16,000 people, and still believing that the era of might uh, belongs to the past. Overall, uh, as uh, with Finland, uh, Sweden successfully facilitated domestic prosperity, as shown in Figure 4. In terms of hard power, though, despite the fact that it's centrally starts better than Finland, uh, it's much doubtful whether it may effectively deter Russia without uh, NATO's intervention. Uh, moving on quickly to Norway, I know it's a bit boring, the, the, this, the, this part of the presentation. I identified no particular regional uh, threats. Norway kept reducing its military personnel before the annexation of Crimea reaching 25,000 people in uh, 2015. Idealistic foreign policy narratives were embraced at the time, supporting the idea that international entropy, international anarchy, could be controlled by engaging its alleged causes, poverty, oppression, etc. Apparently, the Norwegians claim that this is the new realism. In terms of defense, Norway yearly expenses during this period remained almost $5.3 billion, similar to, to, to Sweden. Uh, the annexation of Crimea shocked the Norwegians, who uh, described the incident as a tectonic shift in international uh, relations. Soon after, realism was more evident, of course, uh, with, uh, in, in their strategic with uh, the strategic documents containing views such as uh, the fact that uh, the struggle for power renders difficult the establishment of a rule-based order, and uh, so on, and uh, so forth. Um, accordingly, Norway increased its military spending further and pursued closely bilateral military ties uh, with Western states, particularly the US and, uh, and the UK. On the other hand, though, it kept reducing its active military personnel, which reached 23,000 people in 2019, still articulating idealistic uh, discourses. Realism has been, once again, uh, more evident after the invasion of Ukraine, when the Norwegians further increased military spending to $9 billion, attempting to set in motion the deterrence and reassurance dogma in order to deter Russia, which was founded on the development of endogenous military capabilities and at the same time the communication of clear messages to the Russians so as to avoid misunderstandings that could trigger uh, military retaliation. Uh, yet idealism is still profound in Norway's uh, strategic documents. Overall, Norway facilitated prosperity levels better than any other state in the world, as you can see in Figure 6, the early NATO membership played a significant part in this, since uh, the Norwegians have been consistently feeling much safer than the Finns and the Swedes, uh, a fact that skyrocketed Norway's uh, prosperity values. Uh, however, endogenous hard power capabilities are such that without NATO's contribution, it is debatable whether Russia may be deterred. Summarizing the above, all of the three 
strategies have been similar in principle, keeping the facilitation of prosperity as their beacon and following predominantly idealistic uh, defense policies. Yet in generating effective deterrence, Nordic officials claim, not myself, uh, that they need to improve the size and qualities of their armed forces by directing more resources into them. Now, the question is, has everything been mostly idealistic with this strategy? The quick ones, answer is no, since external balancing, per se, uh, at least in theory, is by all means realistic uh, stance. Uh, other than that, though, what I wish to emphasize, and this is probably the original feature of this uh, article, is that the core objective of these strategies, the pursuit of domestic prosperity, is not irrelevant at all to realistic thinking in its traditional variant in particular. Traditional realists consider human nature as the dominant agent of domestic and international politics. Uh, humans are uh, regarded as rational beings seeking for power, and this finite inclination is reflected on state behavior. In spite of this horizontal assumption that views power as an end, classical realists have not discarded the fact that in power, individuals see the medium to at least facilitate the dominant finite need to remain alive and, emphasis, uh, thrive. Machiavelli, for instance, argued that mankind ironically seeks contentment in safety, prosperity, honor, raising a family, and happiness. In other words, survival and prosperity as well. <laughs> Along these lines, he stated that powerful city-states, such as Athens and Rome, were built on locations that equally favored natural defenses and conditions, the conditions to facilitate uh, the people's prosperity. Thomas Hobbes argued that human search for power is not only natural, but also continues, since one cannot assure the means to live well, not just to survive, without the acquisition of more. Thucydides, Thucydides himself hinted that survival and prosperity together is, dominant, is a dominant political motive by underlining that the decision between Pericles and the Athenians with regard to supporting the war effort in Sparta was not only dominated by which option served best their survival, but also which one would facilitate individual prosperity uh, more efficiently. Morgenthau founded classical realism per se, embarking from the principle that humans seek to satisfy their selfishness. The, the rational manifestation of this, Morgenthau claimed, concerns the individual struggle for power so as to acquire food, shelter, security, money, jobs, marriage and the like. So clearly this is not a mere survival norm that he is describing, but a prospering one. It should also be underlined that classical uh, realists, traditional realists, also embrace the axiom that the birth of state represents the triumph of human instinct, uh, of, of reason uh, over instinct, in that individuals realize that the rational route to increase the prospects of surviving and prospering was to join other individuals and form organized societies. Therefore, it would be valid to argue that in traditional realistic thought, man represents the primary structural element uh, of the state and its inherent inclination to survive and prosper represents the state's natural existential cause. Inevitably, traditional realistic thought nurtures in its core the principle that the ontology of the state is naturally linked to its ability to foster this uh, inner human necessity. The question is how by facilitating prosperity the state's ontology is served. Machiavelli underscored that in societies where this is done, you see denser population, since, since people are happy to marry and have children, wealth and goods steadily accumulate since the fear of confiscation by the state is absent, uh, citizens are eager to pursue both private and public benefits, and so on. As hinted, by this, as hinted by this description, the facilitation of prosperity initially produces gains at societal, at societal levels, level, which may then project upward at state level. These gains are here in turn physical and artificial respectively. With regard to physical, what Machiavelli hinted is that by facilitating the need to prosper, the state reinforces prior to anything else the human will to remain committed to, to the state. Literature emphasizes this, the significance of this commitment, by demonstrating the perils of its absence. The Bible, for instance attributed the collapse of Solomon's kingdom to the compromised prosperity of a large part of the population due to the heavy labor being imposed by the administration. This social condition led to a political stasis 
and the dissolution of the kingdom. Cicero referred to the same mechanism when advising Roman statesmen uh, to make public prosperity the object uh, of all efforts. Uh, more recently, the triggering mechanism of, Arab, of the Arab Spring is to be found, scholars concur, uh, on the fact that these states pose nearly zero prospects for individual prosperity. Other than that, the disintegration of an individual's commitment to a state is also associated with less apparent, yet equally detrimental pathology, such as the following, reluctance to defend the state in times of emergency, unwillingness to generate wealth or pay taxes, uh, loss of interest in politics, and uh, of course uh, the well-known brain drain. Clearly, the consequences of not facilitating prosperity become literally physical in the form of uh, structural cracks in the societal frame of the state. Uh, physical gains aside, though, the facilitation of domestic prosperity may serve the ontology of the state in a more normative and straightforward manner. Thucydides, for instance, underlined that states with prosperous citizenry uh, tend to be more secure, since through the people's wealth, obviously by taxation, accumulation of wealth, etc., etc., um, the state can build its uh, defenses and uh, so on and so forth. In this case, uh, state level gains are termed artificial since they need to be engineered by the government. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, overall, given the physical and artificial gains, it is clear that the, facil the facilitation of prosperity functions as an internal balancing uh, mechanism. The Nordic states have facilitated prosperity almost immaculately and their socio-political stability is uh, undisputed. However, they refrain from generating formidable military capabilities from this prosperity, and more effort is required towards this direction. Nevertheless, with state resources being limited, such a shift to, to hard power would stress domestic prosperity level. In inevitably, the question arises uh, is to, to what degree the latter, domestic prosperity, may be compromised in favor of hard power. One way of addressing the issue is by combining all these theoretical elements presented above with some empirical data. Uh, I need only a couple of minutes. Of course, no problem. Uh, given that the facilitation of domestic prosperity is associated at least with socio-political stability, a relative estimate of a state's prosperity level, that is its prosperity index that we've been using, could at least be also considered an estimate of the state's relative socio-political soundness, provided, of course, that a prosperity-based boundary, a threshold value, if you like, is somehow set, uh, between socio-politically less and more vulnerable actors. The establishment of such a threshold would automatically indicate, roughly, the degree of compromise Nordic prosperity um, could suffer before societal weathering starts to develop. Accordingly, it was observed that during the time frame of interest since the late 2000s, right, no less than 44 major, in terms of size and duration, uh, domestic prosperity-related upheavals were recorded around the globe, as shown in Figure 7. Some of them relentlessly violent, uh, others milder or even entirely peaceful. All of them, though, indicative of severe domestic societal weathering, the result of prosperity actions. The statistical evaluation of these incidents revealed that 95% of them originated in states which ranked prosperity-wise below the 29th place uh, in the preceding uh, year of the uh, uprising, as shown in figure 8. Consequently, if the 95th percentile value, which is ranking 29, is set as a rather conservative socio-political stability threshold, then those states which score higher than place 29 may be considered having markedly fewer chances of developing intense societal distress compared to those which score low. As shown in figure uh, 9, with top world prosperity levels, there is considerable room for uh, the Nordic states to redirect resources to hard power, hence compromising prosperity without endangering societal stability. It is worth noting that intentionally or not, it needs to be examined, uh, the prosperity levels of the US, the most successful actor in the international system, have been successfully, have been consistently kept between 9th uh, and 18th place Maintaining a, functioning balance, maintaining a functioning balance between a physically sound societal condition and a formidable uh, hard power capacity. In conclusion, it was demonstrated, at least that's what I think, uh, that the Nordic uh, grand strategies have been identical in principle or similar in principle, uh, maintaining a deeply traditional realistic goal 
and that was strangely so the facilitation of domestic prosperity. They have been, however, profoundly idealistic uh, with regards to foreign and defense policies. Russian aggression, uh, aggression led to more realistic stances. However, in order to generate effective deterrence, they need to invest more on the armed forces. Empirical evidence indicates that there is considerable room to redirect resources towards our power without uh, endangering societal uh, stability. And thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. So maybe we can make another effort for uh, Mr. Alexopoulos. Alexopoulos. No, he's not. Okay, so I guess Mr. Alexopoulos cannot connect uh, on the internet, on, on uh, Zoom. Uh, thank you for uh, the interesting presentations. Uh, Corinna's presentation was more or less a survey about uh, EU policies toward uh, uh, refugees and uh, displaced uh, people and asylum seekers. And uh, in all honestly, because that's what I understood, it was like a long survey about the policies, the aims, especially after the 2015 uh, European Agenda on mi Migration, uh, I, I really did not understand if this paper was just a survey of if there was actually an argument and a research question. So this is something to be, to be clarified. And then, uh, um, uh, uh, Georgios, if I may, yes, sure. uh, thank you, and uh, Georgios, very interesting paper uh, showing how the three um, uh, countries uh, of the North Finland, Sweden and Norway uh, uh, pursue uh, traditionally an idealistic uh, foreign and defense policy. Uh, the primary concern is about, and if I say something wrong, please uh, uh, correct me, okay, just to have it, uh, because I'm also learning with this process. Yes, of course. Um, so, uh, pr with prim primary uh, concern being domestic prosperity. Uh, so, uh, uh, from what I gathered, you're trying to see how, uh, by facilitating prosperity, uh, we serve the state's ontology, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, so this is the main research question of the paper. Of the paper, yes. And you're using as empirical cases the three uh, the the Nordic grand uh, the three yes. uh, Nordic states grand strategies. It, they served as a good uh, case study. Okay, and and I found that what you did to compare the before and after the invasion in Ukraine uh, is like the critical junctures we're discussing with shelter theory, and uh, we were trying to address in my paper in my confusing yes. uh, methodological design paper with uh, the eurozone and everything um, about uh, how even after uh, uh, the invasion of Ukraine the three countries um, continue to pursue essentially uh, idealism even though they understand and uh, they try to implement more realism, right? Exactly. Uh, yes. uh, uh, because uh, we understand, uh, coming from classical realism, how uh, state survival is um, connected uh, with uh, thriving uh, human communities and also uh, humans uh, need uh, for security. That was exactly my objective and I'm glad it's, uh, okay. it has been communicated correctly. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, I'm opening the floor to questions. I will take uh, some questions so our speakers can address them. Uh, first question. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, congratulations to both. Uh, but uh, Corinna, allow me to pose my question to Georgios. Um, uh, you certainly read your policy documents, and I may stress out that this is not part of your PhD, so you did an independent uh, and extensive work outside the PhD uh, context. Um, you made me uh, reflect on, uh, on a phrase of the type, uh, idealist is what ideal idealist does, or realist is what realist does. Uh, by this I mean, uh, you obviously had to have a criterion about what constitutes idealism. And in the paper, uh, you uh, obviously, the, the work uh, has many parameters, but uh, you use the criterion of not reference to threat, to immediate threat, as a criterion of ide idealism. So my question here, in a Socratic uh, fashion, uh, I'm not arguing with you, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that we're wrong, 
uh, but uh, I, I, I am uh, I was wondering whether it suffices to have a non-reference uh, to to immediate threat as uh, uh, as a criterion of idealism, or you 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 show other things as well that you couldn't mention in your uh, presentation. Um, a comment. Obviously, you you read a lot about how prosperity works, what it is, and how it it, it works. The second uh, act part of your presentation. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan uh, of. Uh, analysis of realist or non-realist thinking in various uh, uh, socio-political uh, socio settings. Um, the title, uh, the, 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 the title of your of that part, realist elements in Nordic Greek thinking. Um, it was a realist guide to understand Nordic Greek thinking, but you didn't mention actual Nordic thinkers, or Scandinavian in that respect, uh, thinkers, uh, um, politicians, scholars, practitioners, um, are reflecting this uh, realism. I mean, you, uh, uh, you, you refer to general uh, realist thinking, very good job at, at that, uh, but um, it could be better if, uh, if you identified a couple of uh, mentionings uh, on behalf of scholars and statesmen, politicians, uh, with a realist uh, veneer. Uh, certainly the Swedish, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we, we can find some, uh, we can identify some realist thinking uh, with uh, Swedish scholars. I did mention though that external balancing per se is a realistic policy but, but by you, itself. You can address, uh, let's cover all oh, the yeah, questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hilary? That's, uh, thank you very much to both presentations. And I'm so happy you are working on migration, which is a, an issue that I think is very, very much on the minds of all of us from the Mediterranean. And um, you mentioned briefly at one stage, um, you were talking about the Ukraine uh, impact and refugees, but I, I think it was mentioned, or maybe I was thinking about it, that there is a different approach then to um, Syrian refugees. And, I think it was towards the end, there was a bit of a lack of time because you went over the site quite quickly, but I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that and whether that is, <clears throat> whether that shows in the policy making that you were talking about, it's more about types of refugees rather than state size and capacity, or whether there's something else we can learn from that for your project. And uh, on, the, on the other presentation, so I, I hope I understood the overall argument that um, you know, the Nordics could pay more for hard power without compromising domestic security. Would, would you please say that again? Because it, the you, distance is... Your core argument is that the Nordics can afford to pay more for hard power without compromising domestic security. No, no, I said that they, they can, they, it's better for them to compromise. I said that um, there is room to compromise prosperity without endangering uh, societal stability. Yes. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. And and so it's inevitable. And so within within that, I have two questions. The the first is kind of following up on the point that you've just asked about uh, Nordic scholars. I'm just thinking of the work of Neumann and Carvalho when they say that actually uh, Nordics prefer to take a different kind of of route to peace and security that's more values based, peacekeeping based, and so on and so forth, and maybe the investment should be better placed there. I'm just wondering your thoughts on this. And the other one is just to be a bit a bit cheeky at the end. At the very end, you said the US is the most successful actor in the international system, and I wonder on what basis you you make that claim. Well, that's, easy. that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to hearing. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. I also have this. I want to build on on the on the second presentation on that it's point: domestic stability, prosperity, external balancing. I think there is one important fact that we have to remember: is that the policymakers actually realize this, and as a result, what we see is, a, especially after twenty twenty two, this big emphasis on an EU level, which connects with the show that you read, right? uh, defense industry. Expansion on the European level, and with the aim of that, that defense is not only bring innovation to the military sphere, but those innovations should go to the civil sphere. So, 
they kind of really understand it and they think that you know it should not only be expensive, it should be some kind of an investment. And I think that as after twenty two you have my suggestion would be just to have a look at that. You know, that they are searching for solutions, not only in the Nordics but on a whole European level what to do about it. So you're basically referring to the practical application of what I just uh, Yes, yeah, practical yeah. application and, 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 and you know there are projects being made on the whole EU level. Um thank you. Um I also enjoyed both presentations a lot and I've got a question which may look as a comment and, and the question is not necessarily to to you the audience, but since it was voiced in your presentation and I didn't really hear it before. Well, not being present for the entire uh, time of the workshop, but still, I believe it's quite an interesting issue. And the starting point of the comment is that uh, you mentioned rules-based international order, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, in the context of the Nordic countries or, or the trio that, that you were particularly interested in as, as adhering to the concept. And um, I happened to read about this issue, and it's 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 way more controversial than it seems because you know, particularly when it is being applied to the Nordic countries, because uh, the thing that we do know about the Nordics, kind of mirroring your command, uh, uh, Hillary, on on uh, on specific way to 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 to, to uh, pursue their uh, their uh, uh, smaller middle power, as Carvalho and Neumann would, would, would suggest, credentials is, is through this law-centric approach to a very large degree. The problem with rule-based international order is that it's not really equal to international law to begin with. It is something that the United States came up with, and it's something that is being heavily criticized by the Russians, Chinese, but let us disregard those criticisms. It is very much criticized by international law scholars because it's uh, applicable, well, kind of it allows one to mirror the, the American, to kind of, to, to, to hide the American interests behind the, 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 the respective actions in the international arena. And this brings me to the question, and, and I'm wondering simply about small states. My country has internalized this discourse about law-based international order, and I'm thinking, whether they are doing this because they think that it's synonymous to international law, because some scholars do, and it's interesting in, in and of itself. Why then a new concept has to be invented? There is a question. Or if they are looking for an extra or like wider, broader shelter in the United States, ultimately adhering to their respective narrative, etc. So I'm simply willing to kind of put this side topic on the table because since quite a lot of us are working on on on, on small states so so uh, an interesting question is of whether certain countries embraced it the actual concept whether whether it was uh conscious and whether they understand the implications of that i would strongly suggest that the nordics they understand the implications of, uh, of that because yet again they've got this law centric tradition they're very much about you know this idea that international law the way we have it it protects small states it protects them and and therefore i'm wondering whether that is something that you came up with or it is something that is present in their documents and their discourse yes. thank you sorry for being so extensive but you know it required explanation the actual question thanks i don't think we have any other questions so let's start with corina Hello, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, maybe uh, there was a uh, huge difference in the treatment uh, of the refugee crisis of 2014 about the Syrian people and the refugee crisis of 2022. 20, uh, 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 that is uh, the U uh, Ukrainian uh, refugee crisis. Uh, we have um, refugees of two classes. Uh, in, 2000, uh, in the 2014 crisis, uh, we had no immediacy and uh, no eagerness, uh, in contrast to the 2022 uh, crisis. Uh, even uh, when it comes to people, to normal, cities, normal citizens, uh, when Ukrainian refugees, they had a warm welcome by the majority of societies, um, especially at schools, uh, children were welcome at schools. In contrast, contrast to the Syrian refugee crisis, that they were not just not welcome, but uh, we had many cases that the schools denied, denied um, 
even enrolling uh, the refugee children into activities or uh, into school per se. Uh, we have um, uh, we have much differences in policy making because um, the policies made for the Ukrainian uh, refugee crisis were uh, immediate. We have we had their um, uh, decrees uh, immediately uh, checked, and so they could work. Uh, in contrast to the Syrian refugee crisis, and the most of all, uh, during the Syrian refugee crisis, the EU initiated the policy that the refugees uh, should be um, uh, should be uh, apply for asylum, uh, uh, asylum, uh, the statue of uh, refugee for asylum uh, in the entry state, and that means that uh, the entry states were mostly the small states. Uh, the small states uh, were not capable of uh, dealing with this situation because they don't have uh, the right bureaucracy, the right amount of people and resources. Uh, and most of all, uh, we don't have uh, huge administ uh, administrations in small states. That means they could not deal with such big amounts of uh, refugees. Uh, that led to not just the suffocations in the hot, uh, at hotspots, but also to the delay, uh, to the huge delay of um, uh, getting the refugee status. And um, of course, that led to all the possible refugees being uh, being characterized as illegal migrants. Um, in contrast, uh, the European Union um, should. Um, should have uh, allowed the possible refugees uh, to apply for asylum in the states that they were situated. And that could uh, push the, uh, the process uh, to go faster. And uh, they could get this, uh, this, uh, the refugee status. And by getting the refugee status, means that their entire life changed completely. They have rights to move, to work, to start a business, to enroll into schools at every level. And that does not happen when someone is characterized as illegal migrant. So that was um, um, that, were, uh, that was the intention of the European Union to push them into small states so that they cannot, in fact, apply for asylum and solve their situation in order to uh, integrate into society. And that uh, created a huge uh, de-Europeanization movement. Uh, it created uh, a crisis of identity, and the EU initial goals um, were uh, troubled. Yes. Uh, now, uh, beginning with the last question, uh, quickly to uh, address it. Uh, yes, the, 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 this rule-based order uh, way of thinking, it's in, it's in the documents. Um, I have elaborated on that on the actual uh, article per se, um, what I could find here in my presentation is a quote from uh, Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs 2017, and I quote, Norway expects all states to comply with international law. That's idealistic by definition. It cannot happen. Okay, so it, it's in their documents, that's why I, I've used it, that's why I've, uh, I've uh, chosen to, uh, to use as far as uh, as far as commenting on their, their idealism, uh, primary resources to avoid contaminations. I've used a policy document, uh, speeches on the, the uh, parliaments, and so on and so forth. So, just to specify the question, if I may, so are they, are they specifically referring to international, um, to rules based international order rather than international law? Well, order or requires. Do they use those synonymous? Order requires uh, rules. Yeah, but the rules, Ru rules, means rules are not necessarily laws. That's the problem. And laws are not the necessarily. In America, do not agree with international law always. They are actually not part of quite a lot of major international regimes, starting from the state of Rome. So therefore, if they are criticizing Russia or China for what they are doing, it's very interesting that they are not talking about international law. And these are major, major, major offenses against international law. They're talking about rules-based international law order. And then we're coming back to the idea of who's making those rules. Because the Chinese and the Russians are also thinking that, yeah, we can make rules. Uh, Mike is right. right? So, so, so uh, what I wanted to refer to is that 
this nuance, you know, between the two con concepts, it's actually important. It's actually very important and very significant. And then when I'm hearing this concept being used, referring to the Nordic countries, I'm very much afraid. I'm very much afraid because if the Nordics subscribe themselves to rules-based international order, then we're living in an entirely new era. Not good for small states at all. But, you know, I just wanted to kind yes, of yes. expose this idea. But I'm, a classical, I'm a classical realist, so uh, mm -hmm. a rules international order for me doesn't sound really, you know, realistic. Uh, in any case, uh, can I move on? Um, as far as the practical uh, application, I couldn't agree more, but it's down to the communication between academics and researchers and practitioners. Uh, the best example, as far as I'm concerned, is, uh, is Israel on that field. In uh, 2017, uh, a, new a new grant strategy for Israel was proposed by Technion University and a bunch of other um, institutions, um, and they were involved more than uh, 200, if I'm, if I'm Correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody has, uh, has been in this. Uh, 200 academics and, and practitioners as well. And they ended up with a new uh, grant strategy for Israel. That's uh, 2017. So, yes, but it's, it, it's a thing that rarely happens, uh, shall I say, here in Greece. Um, you mentioned that uh, may, maybe they are referring to... Um, one of the questions, uh, different, a different kind of security uh, perception. When you're living next to an elephant, and this elephant does not uh, view the international environment the way that you do, then you have to respond in, 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 in a similar manner. Uh, you have a country that has invaded another one for... It has got his reasons, but they're not justifiable. Okay, so what are, you, what are we going to say to them? We'll not be living in that kind of security. We, we think of security in a different way. It's, it's brutal, I think, in my view. Now, as far as uh, whether the US is the most successful actor uh, on uh, the international system, um, we cannot measure that. But we can use numbers to, uh, to uh, make educated uh, assumptions. Okay and uh, make educated conclusions, if I, if I may say. Uh, the gross national income or the GDP of the US is not comparable to, to, to anyone else's. Probably China is, uh, is moving uh, closer now as far as the gross national income is concerned. Um, militarily, uh, they, they cannot even fit in the same scale, uh, China and, and, and the US. The US even more. Uh, once you put in the same uh, uh, military spending graph, the United States of America and, and somebody else, the graph literally reduces to, to, to a straight line. Basically, in material so, terms, because I was asking on what basis, so you say in material terms. In material terms, yes, yes. yes. In terms of power, not only as, a, as, a, as resources, because power may have two um, manifestations. One is uh, resources, as you say, I don't think there's a comparison to, use to that. And the other one is influence. Is there any other uh, international actor more influential than the United States at the moment? I am much how do you How do I measure that? Okay. Well, uh, I think it's self uh, proven, isn't it? It's self okay. it's, 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 uh, uh, for I don't example, want to derail the conversation, I was just being cheeky when I asked the question. Yes. Uh, in, in this point, uh, maybe what uh, Professor Pat, like how do you explain the stance right now with the uh, war in Ukraine where basically only the West supports the US? And if you check what's happening in the rest of the world, the global south, even middle power, grand middle powers like India and uh, all the Southeast Asia, like Southeast Asian nations are completely new, uh, uh, like they're hedging. They're, they're adopting the strategy of hedging towards what's happening with Russia and uh, the US in order not to get in the middle and protect their economic uh, security. So how do you explain that? I guess that's what uh, Professor Patrick. So we see that the, the American influence is actually yawning. 
Yes, true, but it's still uh, it's still uh, it's still high. I would say I, I cannot explain it. To be honest. I cannot explain it, but it's clearly as far as as far as uh, as far as influence is concerned. Maybe yes, it is uh, it is reducing, but material wise, it's it's not even debatable. Yeah, about USB the. Superpowers in the rooms. Um, as a new classical realist, uh, I take inspiration from the classical realist uh, framework. But to for, for me, the thing is with the US being the major superpower in the world, uh, from the materialist materialistic point of view, by measuring the material quantity of power, then perhaps it's much easier to come to this conclusion. But if we look at how the American foreign policy has been like manifested, I don't know, perhaps in the Middle East, like in Iraq or in Afghanistan or in North Africa, in Libya in 2011, uh, I would say that in a long-term strategy, it hasn't been another successful and another failing. How do you measure success? Yeah, I measure success when well, not I measure success. It's exactly not the outcome for, for, for the state per se, not for the rest of the, the, the states involved, maybe. But for the allies involved as well. Yes, it, that, that's, 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 a, that's an interesting point. Uh, please, uh, can, I, can I just uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I, I'm that was a minor point of the presentation, it was just uh, something <laughs> provocative that I put up. <laughs> Uh, I'll use it next. Sorry about it. So maybe it's a presenting was your contribution, right? But talk about the West influence. Something comes to mind there. Take the Arab world, Africa, India, China, Latin America. Is the these are big charts. Are they regions where the Americans are over there? Then I think, or do they hate even the. I don't know. I mean, I'm speaking not. Yes, yes, I, I do understand your rhetorical point. Yes. Yes. yes, of course, of course. They, so what, what they messed it up clearly. In Europe, for example, is there a consensus on American benevolence? And leadership among all European states, I mean, in Russia alone. So where do you consider the big chunks? Where is America? To the extent that it is self-evident that they have influence? In the Western world? Maybe, maybe, yes, in the Western world for sure, yes, yes. But uh, I think the best thing for me to do is to, to take the comment back and just say that <laughs> the US has been a successful <laughs> actor, yes, yes. I do understand uh, where, where you're coming from. I mean, South America was uh, was a mess. Africa was a mess. Middle East was a mess. Yeah, but there is also a but a still uh, a reaction eh, against, uh, against the United States and recently after COVID even against Europe, you know, uh, the ideas of the economic decision and so forth. I mean, <clears throat> let us open our eyes to the to the reality. You know, that, uh, there, it is not so sure that, that, that uh, these countries adore the West or, 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 or you know, have a good vision of the idea of the United States and Europe. Let's test it again, let's find out whether uh, uh, this is true. It's a very useful comment. I, I guess you're right. Eduardo has another question. Yes, yeah. uh, switching from the US analysis, uh, my question is, uh, according to the classical realist theory and to the, like, can I say, brutalist way of seeing foreign policy and personal gain in the cosmos states uh, about the Scandinavia um, scenario, what would you think about a rising uh, Finland compared to the other Scandinavian countries would be a plus for Scandinavia, for the other Scandinavian countries, or like a cons if we can they so 
like a rise of a potential partner or rival in the region? You mean militarily? Yes. Well, the threat is there. So with 16,000 people, you cannot have a, a, a decent defense by any standard. Okay, let's not go very deeply into it. They have 16,000 people. There is, there, is this critical, there is this critical gap between asking for collective intervention and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and between the moment that you are getting this collective uh, assistance. And, and during these critical days, you have to defend yourself. You cannot do that with 16,000 people or with uh, calling up reserves. This could take days. Fail, uh, history is providing us with many examples with uh, states failing during the mobilization to war, not, not, not losing the war. So they, they have to, to build up the military. How much? I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you how, how many soldiers or how many uh, airplanes they need to deter Russia. But we're not at this point. We're at the point that they, that they have, uh, of course, uh, we should not disregard the, the, uh, their technological uh, advantages and uh, the space achievements as well. These are all adding up to, uh, to, the, to the qualitative uh, part of the military strength. But you need people as well. 16,000 people or 20,000 people is a mediocre uh, football team uh, pitch. You can't deter Russia with that. Or anybody else. Um, should, I ask, should I answer Professor uh, uh, Yes, because, and also you have a second question, no, no, right? No. Um, now, the, 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 apart from apart from the ide idealism uh, in, uh, inside the text, okay. First of all, I have to believe what they say in their policy text. I cannot argue with that. If they say we want, we, we expect everybody to comply with international law, I have to accept that this is their position. Okay, this is one. Uh, the idealism, uh, however, uh, for me mostly, is the fact that uh, these these countries are heavily relying on collective. Um, military collaboration, which is nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, they keep domestic military capabilities at, at, at the minimum. So this is the idealism. You don't need the threat to call that uh, idealistic. Because you mentioned uh, the factor of, uh, of a threat. Threats, uh, threats can be born out of nothing. I mean, the, the, the calmness in the Baltic region was, was really uh, a matter of, I don't know, luck. Was probably the, the region irrelevant to uh, great forces antagonism? I, I don't know. But the fact that antagonism was not there doesn't mean that the threat is not there. And it doesn't mean that you, uh, that you will not prepare yourself for, for, for a threat that will arise. I think Professor agrees with you. Thank you. It's, it's good to be on the shores of a name that, like, trust me, it's, 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 a, it's a very good feeling, given all things considered. If there's no other question, I have one last question, if you have answered all questions. Yes, I, I think know. I have. Uh, at some point you mentioned that uh, in their effort to re reconcile uh, this ideal, traditional idealist approach with uh, uh, realism, in order to uh, confront uh, the threats, especially after the, the invasion of Ukraine, they're developing a model of new realism. Uh, or this was specifically for a country, Sweden. No, no this was specifically for, for Norway. For Norway. For yes, Norway. Yes. So could you please elaborate what are the, what this new realism? Uh, I mean, is there, is there, uh, are there elements or it was just a rhetorical observation? It was an expression. An uh, expression, okay. It, it was an expression, but with a theoretical background, if I may say so. Yes. Because uh, they were actually referring to the fact of controlling international entropy via, uh, by, for example, uh, participating in uh, humanitarian missions, by, by, by controlling uh, poverty, by controlling uh, democracy, which, uh, by, by. But if I may interrupt, it's is this new realism for the Nordic states? Because they are the champions of peace operations, of conflict resolution, of humanitarian aid. Uh, all the programs that you see in the universities is all about that, about peace studies, which consist of all this. So this is not something new. 
about uh, that's why I thought that maybe there are elements that we are maybe developing a new model that could inform uh, older theoretical models. I think it was just uh, a not very successful expression because realism is, is something, uh, at least for, for us uh, IR theorists, it's, it's something very specific. So we cannot be arguing about new realism with regards to addressing poverty or democracy. That okay. falls more into neoliberalism, if I may say so. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there okay. any other questions? And with this, thank you so much for the interesting presentation and discussion. And thank you all for your attention and participation. And we'll see you all tomorrow morning. We're okay. convened. That's